Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you be, for being here tonight, especially in this terrible rainy weather. Craven County Board of Commissioners regular session for Tuesday, September 8th is now in session. Madam Clerk, could you call the roll? Commissioner Sampson? Here. Commissioner Mitchell? Here. Commissioner McCabe? Here. Commissioner Liner? Here. Commissioner Booker? Here. Vice Chairman Jones? Here. Chairman Mark? Here. Can we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and the prayer? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. God of us all, we thank you for giving us another day. Bless these commissioners gathered here for extraordinary work and extraordinary times. Inspire them with wisdom as they hope to address the needs of our county in such a difficult period of our shared history. Continue to bless those who labor to attend to the sick among our citizens and those also who strive to find effective treatments and vaccines. Keep us all safe in your divine mercy. May all that is done this day be for your greater honor and glory. Amen. Amen. The first item is the approval of the agenda. Is there any correction or additions to the agenda? Make a motion to approve. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Nays. The ayes have it. Next is a public hearing for COTS Title VI Program five, uh, five, <laughs> six rather, <coughs> Program Plan. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. At the August 17th, 2020 Board of Commissioners meeting, a public hearing was set to be held tonight. The purpose of the public hearing is to receive public comments prior to consideration of approval of the CARTS Title VI Program Plan. The Federal Transit Administration requires that a Title VI program be submitted every three years. Our current uh, our submission date is September 30th, 2020. Okay, do I have a motion to go into public hearing? So, so moved. moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Nays, the ayes have it. We're in public hearing. Mr. Chairman, uh, we do not have any citizen that has signed up to speak to the board tonight. Okay. Make a motion we go out of public hearing. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Nays, there's no nays. The ayes have it. We're out of public hearing. Thank you. Next is petition of citizens. But before we have them here, I want to read something. Comments directly pertaining to policies or issues which are under the statutory or administrative authority of the board, comments during this period shall be limited to those comments directly pertaining to issues which are under the statutory or administrative authority of the board. Each speaker must address the board as a whole and not as any individual commissioner, county staff member, or audience from the lectern, and shall begin his or her remarks by give, giving his or her name and address and the topic about which they intend to speak. Each speaker will have three minutes to make remarks as measured by a timer operated by the county staff. A speaker may not yield any of his or her time to another speaker. Speakers must be courteous in their language and presentation and must abide by the generally accepted standards of decorum. Speakers shall not make the same or repetitive comments whether during a particular comment period or over the course of the multiple comment periods. Speakers shall not attack or insult any person or group of people and speakers shall not give belligerent or hostile comments during any comment period. <coughs> With that, the first speaker. 
Mr. Chairman, we have 14 citizens who decide, uh, desire to speak to the board tonight, and the first citizen is Ms. Kelly Muse from Madam Moore Lane. All right, Ms. Kelly Muse. Good evening, Commissioners. How are y'all this evening? Good evening. Good. I'm Kelly Muse. I live at 612 Madam Moore's Lane, Newburn, North Carolina. Um, I want to speak to you tonight about our school system. It's my understanding that we are seeking another lease on iPads for four years this time instead of three for a little over $3.5 million. Um, if I could give a sec the secretary a copy of an email for her to make copies for you all. I have um, an email here from Dr. Doyle back in February 5th, 2017, where she was questioning um, a sales rep for end of life refurbished iPads to be purchased at a discounted rate. An end-of-life refurbished iPad means that that device can no longer be updated anymore. So these kids have had these iPads for three years, and I'm supposed to accept the fact that they didn't need an update within a three-year time period. Since iPads have been introduced to Craven County Schools, I do not believe that they are the most efficient or effective form of technology. When children go into the workforce, regardless of their post-secondary options, military, tech school, or whatever, they're not going to work on a five by seven screen all day long, every day, with no keyboard. That is what our children have currently been working on every day. Since the introduction of iPads, our scores have continued to decline. In 2017, we were 36th in the state. In 2018, we went to 53rd. In 2018-19, we went to 73rd in the state. The higher the number gets, the worse it is. Today, some information came out from Department of Public Instruction, and I compared the data. Craven County, 8% of our children exceeded growth. See, at 56% of our children met growth, and 36% of our children did not meet growth. That being said, Carteret County, where so many of our teachers have left and went to, the, went to Carteret County schools to work, 53% of their children exceeded growth. 35% met growth and 12% did not meet growth. I also included Pamlico County in that data. 67% of children in Pamlico County has met growth, or exceeded growth, I'm sorry, and 33% has met growth. 0% of Pamlico County's children did not meet growth. The numbers speak for themselves. I've been to many, many, many of our learning hubs that we have set up around Craven County. I see numerous apps, numerous links on our iPads not working. That being said, I've also seen the Arapahoe Charter School children who are on Chromebooks and their apps seem to be working a lot better. They're on Google Classroom, same as us. They're on Canvas, same as us, but they are using a Microsoft Google type device to run Windows based applications and not an Apple device. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker tonight is our Senator, Senator Norman Sanderson. Good evening, Senator. Good morning. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I still don't know what <clears throat> time of day it is. Uh, I'm here tonight just as a support uh, factor for this rest of these group of people that you guys are going to be listening to. Sometimes it's better to me to hear it firsthand than it is after it goes through several different sources. And even though I've heard this same story played over many, many times in the last several years, uh, I think it's becoming more and more of a critical situation that we in North Carolina, along with our counties and along with any help that we can get from local uh, organizations and groups, is something that we really need to put a great deal of effort in trying to bring this to a satisfactory conclusion. I know that it will has been since 2017 a very top priority in the General Assembly, and I know that next year it will, will continue to be. So just know that uh, one of the first steps uh, that you, and, and I think this has been really brought to the front of the class by what we are, uh, have gone through as far as this virus is concerned and uh, what we're still walking through uh, with failure on many different 
uh, levels of getting the information out to our children, especially those who are at home trying to, to maintain their education levels. And so we know the problems. The, the previous speaker spoke about some of those, and those are problems that we're going to have to deal with for years to come because this is not going to be made up overnight, just like this, uh, this system of uh, uh, Internet and uh, broadband is not going to be put in place overnight. Uh, we've been working on it for years, and it takes time for these different groups of people who have to be on board with this to come together. Uh, if you sit around some of those meetings that some of our uh, big, big companies have with our smaller companies and who's going to do what and when it's going to get done and who's going to invest this, it's, it's a very complicated situation. And so I just want to let you know that the state of North Carolina is on board with this. Uh, since 2018, when we passed legislation to put this into effect and to bring this and give it the priority that it wants, uh, we've invested as a state about $79 million uh, towards this effort, towards these grants, uh, to bring small communities and small companies together. Uh, the closest one that I know of, we've got two that's operating right now in Jones County. Uh, they have come together in small communities working through a small company out of Kinston uh, that is providing uh, broadband service through several of these grants. And so it's not impossible uh, for Craven County. When it first started, it was for Tier 1 counties only. In 2019, we moved it to Tier 2 counties to include those. Uh, and this year, we also included a small portion of Tier 3 counties. Because the tier, tier county system, the county tier system does not work from one side to the other, as you well know. There's too many things that are determined by this system, this tier system, and it's not an adequate measuring stick. So just to, uh, just to let you know that uh, that's all I wanted to let you know. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for coming in. Yes, and I'll be glad to answer any questions at any time. I'm Miss Catherine Smith from Smith Farm Road in Havelock. Good evening, Commissioners. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Catherine Smith. I live at 675 Smith Farm Road, Havelock, off of Adams Creek Road. Our community group is here tonight to put a face on what it looks like to live without high-speed Internet. The only options for internet in our community are, high are uh, wireless phone service or satellite. The informational handout that Ms. Holton put in your uh, mailboxes last Friday provides more details on this. These two options, while not optimal, have allowed us to have a basic level of service for email, online banking, bill paying, and other low demand applications. With the onset of COVID-19, our need for reliable high-speed internet changed overnight. It went from being a convenience to a necessity. We were instantly thrown into remote learning, remote working, remote health care, remote grocery shopping, remote church services, even remote contacts with our families. The demand for this level of signal transmission far exceeded the capabilities of our current providers. I'm a psychologist whose professional standard of care continues to be telehealth. During the pandemic, I've spent days, even weeks, numerous hours, trying to cobble together a mixture of services that will allow me to work from my home. I have yet to find an affordable, reliable option for this. I'm more fortunate than some because I have a friend in Moorhead City who lets me use the home office in his home because he has Spectrum. While it's very frustrating for me professionally, I kept two grandchildren to help with schooling last spring for a few weeks when the schools first went remote. <clears throat> Excuse me. That was a near-death experience, by the way, because they lived with us, too. But we, we survived, um, and we're all quite familiar now with the challenges of remote learning. But when those challenges are compounded by a lack of adequate signal transmission, our students are at a grave disadvantage. They have to work their learning not only around the lack of personal contact with their teachers, but they lack the technology to even get the lessons from those teachers. The term digital divide is often used to describe situations like ours, and our children are clearly on the wrong side of this divide. Like electricity and phone services in earlier times, 
Internet has now become a basic utility needed for how we live our lives. Our community is committed to working together to find a solution to this problem. We ask that you join us and support our cause by advocating for a pathway towards affordable, reliable, high-speed broadband service in our community. Time is of the essence. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman, if I may. Yeah. Look at Manager, would you mind getting with this on language and explain to her where we're at on this? So, I mean, it's not on deaf ears of what we've done. She'll so leave far. her contact Later. information. I'll be happy to yeah. get back with her. At the end. Or you could just email me. Or okay. Is it on this? I've got it. You got it. Okay. I've got it right now. Okay. Thank you. Stacy Engel. Mm -hmm. 201 Golden Creek Road, Havelock. Yes, my name is Stacy Engel, and I'm from 201 Golden Creek Road off of Adams Creek Road in Havelock. I'm a single mother of three. My children are teen years. They're, my youngest is 16 and a high school student. And I'd like to talk about the importance of the broadband. As a high school student, she wishes to take some college classes as well. She needs the internet for research. She needs it for uh, upcoming courses she'd like to take. My middle son is now working for the water company and would like to pursue becoming a plant operator at one point. And he needs it for research as, and, and his ministry with his music ministry for his uh, church services uh, that he does. And my oldest son uh, was a college student when this uh, COVID hit. He was badly affected because without good internet uh, connection, having to try to rely on a phone, um, his classes were, he was not able to complete some of his classes. Uh, aquaculture is not something that easily transitions there. And the fact that he could not get good internet access and would have to sit in his truck in town at times, and it was very frustrating when he typed an entire paper only to have it glitch and disappear. Um, made it very difficult for him to the point where he's not pursuing his education as broadly this year. He's kind of holding back because he does not have that reliability in his home. And so, and myself as an instructor, I, I have students um, who I have to do advertising and, and communication with and, and try to continue my own education as well. And so not having uh, broadband or, or reliable internet for us is, is is definitely a deficit in our home and so if it's something that we would really you know would appreciate being looked at for the Adams Creek uh, bachelor uh, community area uh, thank you thank you thank you mr. county manager uh, I think we're going to have a number of speakers from the Havelock area and it might be a good idea if you had a some type of a short meeting with all of these people rather than one at a time Sure. with the commissioner from that area and this way everybody would know what myself you and Jason and Gene have been doing to try and get internet service sure Be happy to All right. thank you Maria Clark from 3250 Adams Creek Road Maria Clark, I reside at 3250 Adams Creek Road, and I would like to speak on the broadband on behalf of my kids. I have a middle schooler and an elementary schooler. We did the whole virtual learning in the spring. My daughter, who was an AB student from third grade on up to seventh, if they would have counted grades, would have failed sixth grade year from an A to a 54. Um, we have gone back. I contacted before school started back with the Board of Education with lack of internet out in our area. Their first suggestion to me was to, we have businesses in the community, go sit in the businesses parking lot, use their Wi-Fi connection. Unfortunately, that does not present a learning environment for any child, especially a child who has ADD or ADHD. Then we got with the schools, they told us, oh, well, we have hotspots. Unfortunately, the hotspots the county has does not work in all of Adams Creek. So now we are working on a flash drive, which puts my kids a week behind all the other kids in the county. So should the kids get to go back after this first nine weeks, I feel my students and the Adams Creek students who are working on these flash drives will be further behind than any of the other students. 
So if we could get the broadband out there to where they could Zoom, which is the main way that they're communicating with their teachers so that they wouldn't miss these lessons, you would still have your students making, that make ABs, continue to make ABs because they will not be missing the biggest majority of their learning. And that is it, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Mrs. Clark. Ray Griffin, uh, 1981 Streets Ferry Road, Vanceboro. You didn't go back to school you. now, did you? Do I now? <laughs> I said you didn't go back to school now, did you? Not yet. But anyhow, God bless you. Ray Griffin, 1981, Street Ferry Road, Vanceboro. Just want to talk for a few minutes about voting. We are in a critical situation, and Craven County has a, a lot of issues that they can help with the voting. And many of you have thought I was crazy and said some crazy things, but we see what's going on now. We see what's happening. The virus is affecting many people, and I said before, and I'll say it again, we haven't seen nothing yet. It's going to get a whole lot worse. You can have your grants, you can get your FEMA money, stimulus money, whatever you want, but it's all taxpayers' dollars. It's all coming out of our pockets. So we need to put people in legislation that are going to vote for the right purpose, the right way. And I noticed that on your general comments, you had uh, on the agenda, you done away with the general comment, and I was just wondering why. But you people have the ability to sway people how to vote, tell them what to do, the things that are going on, and to make Craven County a better place to live in. And we see uh, one thing that I talked about was the ABC stores and different things. Isn't it sad when ABC stores have presidents over the church? They can shut the church down and keep the ABC stores running. And it's sad that things are happening the way they are. We need to get out and vote for what's right. Vote for the truth. Vote for those that will uh, look out for you and I and for this uh, world and the best thing. If you are a liberal radical that supports global warming, hates America, hates uh, uh, supports homosexuality, abortion, supports gun control, and, uh, and other liberal causes, you are considered today to be a genius. And it's sad that the people now are doing things and getting away with it and they're happy and content. The radicals have showed uh, uh, things that we should never be applauded, supported, or encouraged. They are ignorant about so many areas of life, they are incapable of understanding real moral situations. We need to get out and vote for people that will stand on moral and critical situations. Craven County now has had the drugs and once again has rampant it and we see things happening because of the virus and things are changing. And there are people out here that have total contempt for anyone not arguing with them for their stupidity. How is it that we can let people get away with so many crimes today and people are not standing on the truth and enforcing the laws? We need people that are going to stand on the infallible word of God, the Bible, and you guys swore and put your hand on that Bible that you would do the best you could do to uphold this county. And you are doing, I know in this crisis, it's rough. Bless your heart. You've had some bad days, I'm sure. But I hope there's a better day for the child of God, a better day for Craven County, hoping this virus to get over with. And sadly, everything is abnormal instead of normal. And hopefully you guys can get back to some normal surroundings and do things that is right. But just get out and vote and do what God would have you to do. Thank you, Ray. Much again. Yeah. But anyhow, bless y'all. Michelle Pittman. Good evening, Michelle. Good evening, everyone. I appreciate your time and attention tonight. Um, I'm going to be speaking on the broadband issue. I'm Michelle Pittman, 201 Lige Piner Road in Smyrna. Um, I am the owner of farmland on Smith Farm Road, which is below the Harlow area off Adams Creek Road. I'm here tonight to tell you how the lack of broadband or high-speed internet has affected my family in an agricultural business. This farm has been in our family since the 1800s, and I'm the sixth generation of Smiths to own this land. Since she was a little girl, our daughter has always taken a keen interest in farming, and we always thought our farmland would be the perfect fit for her one day, until we realized it wasn't. 
Two years ago, at the age of 20, she started her first farming business, growing culinary mushrooms. Her intention was to start this business on our family farm. However, the lack of access to affordable and, more importantly, reliable high-speed internet meant this was not an option for her. You see, farming is not a low-tech business anymore, and access to internet is essential to farming as it is to any other business. Her mushroom crops grow in an environment highly controlled for temperature and humidity, which must be monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When temperature or humidity need to be adjusted, this is done through internet access to the controllers of the airflow systems and humidifiers. The only options at our farm for internet access are through cellular phone service or satellite. Neither of these options are affordable or reliable enough for an enterprise that requires 24-7 monitoring and access. Without access to affordable and reliable high-speed internet access, she had to look elsewhere for a place to set up her farm. She set up her first location in Beaufort and has now expanded to a second location in Moorhead City. We have a wonderful farm waiting for the next generation to live there and make a living providing healthy, healthy locally grown food for our community. But until there is high-speed internet access, that just isn't going to be an option. It is also so disappointing to see a young person in their 20s, she started this at 20 years old, who wants to farm, not that many do anymore, and she has the land to build that farm, but lacks a basic utility that's going to make that possible. High-speed internet is no longer a luxury, but a necessity for homes, schools, and businesses. Those who have the option to go elsewhere to work and live, unfortunately, will and are doing so, and you'll hear about more of that later. For those who cannot, the social and economic divide will only widen. I'm asking tonight for your support to advocate for and support our efforts to bring affordable, reliable, high-speed Internet to our community. And again, I thank you for your time and attention this evening. Thank you. Guy Manasia from 526 Joyner Road, Havelock. My name is Guy Maniacci, 526 Joiner Drive, Havelock, right off of Adams Creek Road. And I'm here for the same situation that everybody else is here for. Originally, I was told three years ago that Centrelink covered our area and that we were able to get 25 megabit of data. And in six months before I'm ready to move in, I'm told, well, I don't know who told you that. I went to a, a place and actually gave me the information. They actually gave me a piece of paper and they said, well, they were wrong. There's not enough cable there to do it. So for all these years, this county is assuming that Centrelink is our service provider and that we have internet service and we don't. So ultimately, I have to go to satellite. And on satellite, I'm paying $150 a month for 50 gigabit of data a month. Now, I'm in business. I download, on a daily basis, 250 megabyte files. And there are times when I actually run out of data before I'm even halfway through the month, to a point where I now have to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning to use my extra data, and I even run that out before the end of the month. 2 o'clock in the morning to do downloads so that I have the ability to work the next day. If I don't have those downloads, I can't work, I don't make money. I don't make money, I can't pay my mortgage, I can't pay anything. So I'm sorry, but somebody's got to do something about getting us the data that we need down, down in that area. And you know, I've spoken to people about, did you sign up, did you, did you do the survey? Yeah, I did the survey. When I didn't work in the area, I did the survey, saying that I don't have the internet service. And I'm told, oh no, go to Spectralink, they got it. And then when you go to Spectralink, you don't have it. So it's, the, the Spectralink is lying and it's causing everybody down that area to not have the services that they need. That's the bottom line. I'm done. Thank you. Mary Jo Gamble from 125 Waterway Drive, Havelock. <clears throat> My name is Mary Jo Gamble, and I live at 125 Waterway Drive, Havelock. 
I share the following on behalf of my neighbor, Robert O'Brien, a physician currently practicing radiology in Roanoke, Virginia. My family and I have a second home, which we desire to make our primary residence in Havelock. The home is located at the end of Adams Creek Road. The greatest prohibition to our full-time move is the lack of reliable high-speed internet. This is essential for my work. As a radiologist, I often read CAT scans, MRIs, x-rays, etc. from my home workstation. It has been a standard for many years in radiology to read urgent or emergent studies after hours from home. In the last 10 or so years, it has become increasingly common to read a large volume of routine studies from home. Teleradiology was around long before telemedicine in general came into more popular use. Several of my friends and colleagues have expressed interest in real estate in the same area as mine, but are reluctant to move forward predominantly for the same reason. I know there has been recently a greater interest and push nationwide and locally to expand internet services to rural areas for many reasons. I respectfully ask for help in this matter in any way you see fit. Sincerely, Robert F. O'Brien, MD. In addition, I have been in touch with the North Carolina Broadband Infrastructure Office. The point of contact is Angela Bailey, who has provided some valuable information regarding technical assistance, grants, and an important survey on connectivity and satisfaction within our community. This survey is an essential part in gathering accurate data about local connectivity and ensuring the experiences of our community are heard. Please visit www.ncbroadband.gov for more detailed information. A link to the survey can be found directly on their homepage. It is of note that of the 382 responses to date from citizens of Craven County, 61% were somewhat to extremely dissatisfied with their service. The NC Broadband website additionally provides in-depth information to assist in ways of providing broadband services to the rural and underserved areas of North Carolina. Further details that I have can be provided to whoever you deem appropriate to address this information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Terry Atherton, Atherton, excuse me, 600 Journal Road, Havelock. I'm Terry Atherton from 600 Joyner Drive, and my next door neighbor, Bill Scan, is out of town, but I'm here to read his letter to you all. He says, I'm a self employed consultant in the maritime field. Most of my work involves training professional mariners in a variety of subjects, including navigation, navigation rules, ship handling, tank ship operations and team resource management. Like just about everyone else in the immediate geographic area, my available internet service is limited to either cellular or satellite. The problems with these sources are primarily that satellite is slow and cellular has limited monthly data. In addition, both are expensive, especially for individuals whose usage requires the best available speed and largest data package. There's no bundle available that includes TV and internet, which also contributes to the high overall cost. Prior to the COVID-19 lockdown, most of my work involved travel to a training site, either at a training facility or on site at the client company's facility. When preparing for these presentations, expensive internet problems were a significant inconvenience. With slow download upload speeds, the inability to watch a short video without stalling and buffering, and the inability to reliably video conference. However, due to the restrictions in travel and interstate quarantines imposed due to COVID-19, I've recently been involved more in distance learning situations, which require video conferencing on apps such as Zoom and Microsoft Team. That has made fast and reliable internet service a requirement rather than a convenience. Due to limitations in available bandwidth and reliability on satellite service, 
I am unable to conduct training courses from my home office. It's necessary for me to travel long distances to a training facility in a state that allows me to enter without quarantine in order to video conference with my class in yet another state. As you have undoubtedly heard, there are many other business users in the affected area who require faster and better service, as well as a number of school-aged children who are now on the receiving end of distance learning. I believe that all of us are seeking a solution much faster, more reliable, and less costly than that which we currently have. Best regards, Bill Scan. Thank you. Thank you. June Bryan, 255 Golden Creek Road. Good evening, everyone. My name is June Bryan. My husband, Ernest, or Rusty, as most know him, and I live at Golden, 255 Golden Creek Road in the Bachelor community. We own Sure Shot Gun Sports at 3230 Adams Creek Road. It is a 500-yard outdoor shooting range and gun store. I have lived in the community for 71 years. My family before me since the early 1920s. My husband's family has had a home since the early 1950s in this community. We have made our living here our entire married life, 53 years, farming, fishing, guiding hunting parties, and with Sure Shot Gun Sports. A little history. Adams Creek Road was not paved until after World War II. Electricity did not go to the end of the road until the late 1940s. We got telephones on the east side of Long Creek in August of 1968, three months before I got married. We have always been the left out Craven community. Sure Shot Gun Sports opened March 30th, 2011. We knew we were going to be challenged electronically, but we owned the land and we had the desire. Telephones in our area have not improved since they were put in in 1968, sadly. We still have regular outages and such poor reception you cannot have a conversation many times. After heavy rains, we're often without phones for days. Every service at the time was advertising internet. Roadrunner, the phone companies, everyone was offering internet. But when we started calling to sign up for our service, we always got the answer, sorry, we don't go there. It isn't fast, easy, efficient, but it is acceptable, I guess. There are point-of-sale programs. There are security systems that require Internet. They also require good phone services. We have been able to cobble together a working system. Uh, most of the time. I say that as I stand here before you tonight, we do not have phone service. Our phones abruptly quit at midday on Friday, a holiday weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Rusty Bryan, 255 Golden Creek Road. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Rusty Bryan. I live in the Bachelor community at 255 Adams Creek Road, and I'm going to speak about Farm Bureau support for this project. 
Farm Bureau is the largest volunteer organization in North Carolina with over 500,000 member families. Their stated goal is to improve the life of rural residents. I'd like to read to you a list of their policies concerning high-speed internet. NC Farm Bureau strongly supports the availability of broadband, broadband internet to all North Carolina residents. We've worked actively with others to increase funding for grants that internet service providers and the telecommunications companies and electric co-ops can access to help build high-speed infrastructure in North Carolina. These grant funds are available at the state level through NC Department of Information Technology and federally through entities like USDA Rural Development. We support requiring companies that win broadband bids to quickly build our infrastructure or face significant fines for doing so. Any fines should be earmarked for broadband infrastructure in underserved areas. Communication services should be available at a reasonable cost to all people. We support increasing high-speed access in rural areas through any source, including wireless, by using a combination of tax incentive, grants, and or regulations. Networks should meet and exceed the FCC's definition for broadband. We support increased cooperation among internet providers to improve access to broadband in rural areas through coordination or sharing of either current assets or the installation of necessary infrastructure. We support identification of underserved areas in regards to broadband availability and the prioritization of those areas in terms of resource allocation. We support a more granular data set than the U.S. Census blocks being used in determining broadband coverage. A U.S. Census block is an arbitrary area where information is grouped together for census purposes. The FCC claims that if one address in a census block has high-speed connectivity, that all addresses in that census block have that same high-speed connectivity. This is simply wrong. The FCC says this about our address on Adams Creek Road. They claim that we have access to the following list of providers and uh, companies. Uh, number one, Charter Communications, which is a cable company, Viasat, which is a satellite, Hughes, Settle, Hughes Network Systems, which is a satellite. We do have that, but it's poor service and it's expensive. If it rains, you don't have service. If it's cloudy, you don't have service. Okay, CenturyLink Incorporated, ADSL, Telephone and Data Systems, and VSAT Systems. But uh, we don't have anything except a little bit of the Usenet, and it is not capable of handling the program. Thank you, sir. We, we need your help. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Linda, and I'm sorry I, I can't pronounce that last name, from 524 Jonah Drive in Havelock. I'm sorry. I can understand the difficulty. <laughs> I married my husband. I couldn't pronounce it either. <laughs> my name is Linda Brunall. I live at 524 Joyner Drive in Avalon. I'd like to share with you a letter from one of my neighbors. Her name is uh, the Parker family. They live on Live Oak Drive. And it says, we are desperate for high-speed Internet service at our home. 990 Live Oak Drive, Havelock, North Carolina. Two of us are working remotely from home. Another is doing daily college homework online, and we have video appointments with VA doctors regularly. We have been reaching out to Spectrum for 25 years for help. We currently have Verizon wireless data with a MiFi 4G jetpack at $85 a month and satellite via HughesNet, another $87 a month, and DISH Network at $119 a month. However, even with both internet options, we are limited in data and throttled after a few days. Streaming movies and shows is not simple and takes over 10 minutes to load at a time. Our internet options work fine before the data caps. However, they run out in less than a week. We must then drive to friends' homes in Havelock to finish much of our internet needs. We would appreciate any help you can provide to help us get high-speed internet here at our address. 
Thank you, David, Cheryl, Tyler, and Austin Parker. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker, Jacob Joplin from 3508 Country Club Road. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jacob Joplin. I live at 3508 Country Club Road in Moorhead City. I'm the CEO of Carter Craven EMC, and I'm here as the last speaker to talk about reliable internet service. The cooperative for 80 years has provided, as a not-for-profit not organization, provided its member owners safe, reliable, and economical energy. Now, the cooperative themselves were born to serve, born, served without bias in the 1930s and 40s when the IOUs did not want to bring energy to the rural areas, did not see that investment. Tonight, the cooperative here to stand with the community groups in Adams Creek as they search for reliable internet service. Now, the cooperative is not an internet service provider, but as a member owner electric cooperative, we feel like we are very well positioned to support the community groups in Adams Creek. We have over 36 miles of overhead distribution line that extends to every individual that spoke tonight. All of our members, all 500 homes and businesses, and we feel like we could leverage this infrastructure to be able to bring internet to the community. Now studies have shown that if you supply internet through the air over the pole line, it's about 50% less the cost of putting it in the ground. And that's always been a large roadblock hurdle to overcome with internet, expanding internet. Also, we've been helped by last year, the uh, General Assembly General Assembly approved the bill to allow the electrical co-ops to partner with internet service providers and use our existing easements without the threat of property lawsuits for internet service. Now also with our poll line, we'd also like to help the community group by our contacts and our relationship with incumbent internet service providers. We'd like to develop a proposal for those service providers that includes the cost of providing that service through our poll line, and then also to help secure federal and state grants as a partnership with the cooperative, as what uh, Senator Sanderson spoke of earlier. So we're here tonight to support the homeowners at Adams Creek as we can with our poll lines and our relationships, and we would ask also that you would also provide that support, consider that support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead. Um, if you would allow, Jack and myself had planned later on in the meeting to discuss about some of our meetings. I think it would be useful why the citizens are still here for to allow the county manager just to make a few statements about the last meetings. And I didn't I mean to interrupt. Good, I think it's a good idea. Too. No, I was going to go more into him and everything else, but I know you all have had That's great. Yeah. <clears throat> if you don't okay, care, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I, I'm glad Mr. Joplin's here. It, there, that's what he just said is the first step to move forward from what we've learned over the last several months. And EMCs are a great partner with communities, just like the Harlow community or some of our other rural parts of the county that need a service. Um, over the last three weeks, um, myself, Gene Hodges, Steve Bennett, Commissioner Jones, and Chairman Mark have all been attending meetings with a company called East Carolina Broadband. And they're, they're familiar with working with groups like Carter Craven EMC or the Jones Onslow EMC where they're working now. Um, Senator Sanderson mentioned early that there had been uh, two projects in Jones County, and that was by East Carolina Broadband. Um, we've had some great meetings with them. I think they've gone much faster than we initially um, thought about. However, the complication in some areas where they don't have what Mr. Joplin has is they don't have that infrastructure to run the, the lines down. We're using more aerial assets like water tanks, grain towers, right. things of that nature. Um, there's been a lot of progress. We spoke um, last week with East Carolina Broadband about Harlow. I mean, that was one of our target areas. The issue in Harlow with East Carolina Broadband is there's not a lot of aerial assets to shoot above the tree line from point to point. That's why it's so vital to use the infrastructure that they have in place to run that fiber down. Um, right. And it's not nearly as, as finicky as it can be with a radio signal. 
Um, so what we have proposed, and we're going to talk a little bit later with the board about, is we're at a point where we can do a test case, we think, with East Carolina Broadband. Um, and I think this would be a great companion project, since you have a partner here at the podium that's willing to take that on, that you can kind of work in parallel between Western Craven County and Eastern Carol uh, Craven County in support of what's called the Great Grants. Senator Sanderson also spoke about that. I believe last week the governor signed a bill which put more money in there, which will create a second application for folks like Craven County, or uh, excuse me, Carter Craven EMC or East Carolina Broadband to apply for the funding to serve underserved communities. Those grants are due October the 14th. So we are sort of in the sprint phase versus the jog phase, okay? We're at a point where we've got to move forward. Um, I think at this point, uh, obviously, everything that the speaker said are what we're hearing from across the county where you're in rural areas without connectivity, right? I mean, it has become a vital asset. I think our support is advocating for the grant applications that either a, uh, an organization such as uh, Carter Craven could put in. One point, we are still prohibited as a county government from providing internet service. So we can be the backbone in certain cases of our middle mile fiber, but at the end of the day, someone has to be the provider and the last mile that's connecting from the middle mile to the to the home i think that's pretty much all i can cover commissioner jones gene steve did i leave anything out that you think is important um, obviously with the east carolina broadband it does have to be above the tree level trees are a problem for them so you don't get quite the coverage as you would run in a line directly to the home that's obviously the best way but from a cost perspective that can also be the highest cost the only comment i have is is with the, the cable companies that is state run uh, i've been getting a lot of emails and phone calls and that's state run the county has nothing to do with with the, moving the companies to do something uh it would be through the uh what was department of commerce right we used to have some authority through franchise agreements that was stripped of counties right. years ago where basically they still print our phone number on the bill but we have no mechanism to enforce any type of expansion or even as commissioner mitchell and i talked about last week even service quality mm -hmm. con, uh, comments yes. which we have a lot of depending on the provider i mean i can do just what a citizen can do is call the 1-800 number and get on the line and, and wait for somebody to address all my right concern. all right thank you sir Thank you. But we'd like to, I think, Mr. Jabba, if you could leave your contact information, I'd love to talk to you more about the project. Yes, sir. I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jabba. Yes, sir. You know, I'm good friends with Curly Brazel, and, and he says you were a hot shot, and you got a lot going for you. So he, he was right. And when you get praise from Curly, you know, we appreciate it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I respect Curly a lot. Thank you. <laughs> okay. That's the end of the Yes, sir, Mr. Citizens. Chairman. That's all. Okay. okay, next is the consent agenda, which consists of the minutes of August 17, 2020 regular session, tax releases and refunds, health department contract, uh, population health. Uh, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay, may I have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Sampson? Yes. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. Commissioner McCabe? Commissioner Liner? Yes. Commissioner Booker? Yes. Vice Chairman Jones? Yes. Chairman Mark? Yes. Thank you. Next, we have the pleasure of introducing Lauren. Wanzell, who is uh, on the district staff of Congressman Murphy. Good, Good evening, evening, Laura. Good evening. Lauren, my name Laura, is, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Lauren Wanzell, and I am a member of Congressman Murphy's district staff. First, I want to thank Craven County Manager Jack Veit, Assistant County Manager Gene Hodges, and all of the commissioners for having me here tonight to speak about our office and for providing us an office in Craven County. We are very excited to be here. Our new office is located at 2402 Dr. At 2402 Dr. MLK Jr. Boulevard in Newburn. 
within the Veterans Services Center. I also wanted to extend thanks to the staff of the Veterans Services Center for being so helpful and welcoming. As I get settled in our new office, it has been very appreciated. I am a district staff caseworker and I cover Craven and Pamlico counties, but we also have caseworkers in our Greenville, Jacksonville, and Edenton offices that cover the various other counties in the 3rd Congressional District. As caseworkers, we act as a liaison between constituents and federal agencies. So the first step to receiving assistance from our office would be to fill out our privacy release form, and this allows us to speak to a federal agency on the constituent's behalf. A couple examples of how our office may provide assistance is working with IRS to track down a stimulus check or issues with a tax return, assisting with cases regarding passports or visas with the U.S. Department of State, FEMA claims, and as we have a large population of veterans in eastern North Carolina, we assist with the VA in claims, benefits, billing, appointments, and other matters. These are just a few examples to paint a clear picture of ways that we can assist constituents with a federal agency. We as caseworkers cannot force an agency to expedite a case or act in favor of a constituent. However, we can, can, we can intervene to facilitate the appropriate administrative processes encourage an agency to give a case consideration, and as caseworkers, we always advocate for the constituent to receive a fair and timely response. If you are unsure if we can assist you with a federal issue, feel free to reach out to our office, and if we cannot help you, we will be sure to direct you to somebody who can. In addition to this, our office is also accepting applications for nominations to attend a U.S. Service Academy. These applications are due to our office October 1st and provide and a copy of the application and requirements can be found on Congressman Murphy's website at gregmurphy.house.gov. I am also the point of contact for Service Academy nominations, so please reach out to me with any questions or concerns about this um, at the Craven County office, and the phone number for that office is 252-636-6612. Our offices are all open Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m., and we are currently operating on an appointment-only basis due to the coronavirus. With the coronavirus pandemic, we understand that many civic and community events have been canceled or postponed, but please know that when these do resume, we would love to be able to participate and become more involved in the community. Thank you again for all of the support that you have provided us, and we are so grateful to be partnering with you and to be here in Craven County. Thank you again for allowing me to come here and speak about our office, and I look forward to assisting you in any way I can in the future. Do you have any questions? Yeah, thank you, Lauren. <laughs> thank uh, you. Do any of the commissioners have any questions? Uh, I have a question. Maybe you remember me. I, I left a paper there to, for you to look into something. Mm -hmm. and I called, and I We've still been haven't heard back. Our caseworker, uh, well, our staff member in D.C., Ray, he's been working on the issue that you spoke to me about with the city of New Bern. Is that correct? I appreciate the goodness. Okay. Well, I will send you, I'll call you on, um, I can call you tomorrow and give you an update on that if you would like me to. Or I can have Ray call you and he'll have more information for you. Does that work for you? Commissioner okay. Liner. Lauren, how many, how many people have you seen since you've opened? I don't know an exact number. It has been busy, though. There have been people in and out calling um, a lot of phone calls and a lot of open cases. So it's been very busy. Um, probably 10 to 20 have made appointments, but a lot of phone calls and open cases. So it's been very useful having an office here. It has. It has. Thank you. Any other questions? I think we just we commend Congressman Murphy for having yes. an office in Craven County. We have not had that. And uh, thank you for being a part of that. And I know you will relate to him. I think I can speak on behalf of this board and say, you know, we really appreciate having that presence here. Well, we're happy to be here. So anything that we can do to assist in the future, just give us a call and we'll be happy to help. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Next is Department Mattis Carts, Kelly Walker. First, we um, have the request for the CARTS Title VI Program Plan adoption. The current Title VI Program Plan expires November 30th of 2020, and it is located on the CARTS webpage. 
The proposed Title VI program uses a template that was provided by the North Carolina Department of Transportation Integrated Mobility Division. There is no change to the program itself, just the format in which the plan is written uh, requires additional information and the frequency with which carts must present this plan for signature. And so we're requesting approval um, of the updated Title VI program plan. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Being no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Nays, the ayes have it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, next, we have a budget amendment request for 5311 CARES Act funding. Um, it is in the amount of $56,215 to reflect. Collect 5311 CARES Act funding that CARTS has been approved to receive through the North Carolina Department of Transportation. CARTS will be using this funding for the rural portion, 60% of the procurement cost of bus shields and lift guards. <coughs> bus shields are a barrier around the driver to protect the driver from droplets and is directly related to COVID-19. Lift guards are equipment that will be added to the vehicles to prevent someone from falling out of the door when the lift platform is below floor level. Any amount left over after the procurement of this equipment will be used in accordance with the budget submitted with the 5311 CARES Act application. Okay, do I have a motion on this? So move. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Being no discussion, I'll have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Sampson? Yes. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. Commissioner McCabe? Yes. Commissioner Liner? Yes. Commissioner Booker? Yes. Vice Chairman Jones? Yes. Chairman Mark? Yes. Okay, and next we have a budget amendment request for the 5307 CARES Act. Um, that is in the amount of $30,000 to repl reflect 5307 CARES Act funding. CARTS has been approved to receive through um, through the FTA. CARTS will be using this funding for the urban portion or 40% of the procurement cost of bus shields and lift guards. Um, we've already previously explained what those items are. And, in, and like with the 5311, any amount that's left over after the procurement of this equipment will be used in accordance with the budget submitted with the 5307 CARES Act application. Okay, a motion please. So second. We have a motion and second. Any discussion? <clears throat> Any no discussion or roll call vote, please. Commissioner Sampson? Yes. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. Commissioner McCabe? Yes. Commissioner Liner? Yes. Commissioner Booker? Yes. Vice Chairman Jones? Yes. Chairman Mark? Yes. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Uh, next is the Sheriff's Department, and I guess Tony Lee is not here. <laughs> no, sir. The new Tony Lee. Yes, Captain, thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Good evening, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Thank you for letting me be here tonight to discuss some matters on the agenda. Um, I have three matters tonight to be budget amendments, something everybody loves to hear. First one is going to be for telephone expenses that were not accounted for in budget. They're totaling $45,912, and it covers cell phones for investigators. MiFi's for laptops, smartphones for, smartphones for other investigators, and then FirstNet phones for command staff. And I could break it down, but the total is 45,912. And this was an oversight in the budget. Had a bunch of new players in place. And at the end of the time when the budget was reviewed, it was, it was not seen. And it was caught later. So I would have motion to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? And no discussion. Can I have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Sampson? Yes. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. Commissioner McCabe? Yes. Commissioner Liner? Yes. Commissioner Booker? Yes. Vice Chairman Jones? Yes. <clears throat> Chairman Mark? Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. The next one is a budget amendment. It's a donation from a, it's an anonymous. They would like to remain anonymous for a gift of $5,000 to the Sheriff's Office to help upfit the rescue vehicle. The LESO program, which we got it from, has certain standards and guidelines in which we have to demarket so it's not a military 
looking vehicle and more of a rescue vehicle for the sheriff's department. That includes painting, putting some lights on, and some more equipment. But this is a donation for $5,000. I have a motion. So move. Second. Okay, any discussion? Okay, no discussion. Can I have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Sampson? Yes. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. Commissioner, Commissioner McCabe? Yes. Commissioner Liner? Yes. Commissioner Booker? Yes. Vice Chairman Jones? Yes. Chairman Mark? Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The last and final topic I have is a, an agenda, a budget amend, amendment. We <coughs> talked tonight. And for a total of 61000 to your $68. And what this is for is one PO that was entered late in the year, in the end of June, 1st of um, July, at the end of budget cycle. In other words, for invoices totaling 41000 What these for were for vehicles that came in, equipment that came in, kind of much like the ride equipment we discussed last time, came in late in the year. The invoices were submitted late. As such, they were not gotten in on last year's budget. This money was there in the last budget and will be carried over um, with your approval. Okay. So move. Make a motion. Second. Are we at motion? Second. Discussion. And no discussion. No call vote, please. Commissioner Sampson. Yes. Commissioner Mitchell. Yes. Commissioner McCabe. Yes. Commissioner Liner. Yes. Commissioner Booker. Yes. Vice Chairman Jones. Yes. Chairman Mark. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Y'all have a good evening. Okay. Thank you. Next on the agenda is Ronnie Entry with Department Matters Tax Update or Plans to Restart the Tax Billing Collection Activities. Uh, what? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of two of my key staff members here. Jane Purifoy is with me tonight. She's our personal property manager. And Cindy Glover, our tax collection manager with our department. At the last meeting, uh, I reported to you the collection percentage for fiscal year ended June 30th at 98.7%. And as I mentioned at that time, that was down about a little over, a little more than one half of 1%. The, the reason for that decline, as you know, tax collection percentages uh, vary from year to year. Sometimes, some years they're up, some years they're down. This one was down more than most, and of course the reason for it is the COVID-19 pandemic and the fact that we, uh, after consultation with the county manager and the attorney, decided to take a more hands-off approach as far as enforcing the collection of delinquent taxes. We thought it was the right thing to do at the time and we suspended any of the normal enforcement remedies that we could have used to collect the delinquent taxes in favor of letting those payments come in as they could. Now that we have billed the 2020 tax levy and revenue is starting to flow again, uh, Mr. Veit and Attorney Grady and I have spoken at least twice and we uh, recommend that we sus suspend, continue to suspend these uh, collection enforcement remedies until we would normally employ them in February of next year. There is a billing activity of course you know we've been sending tax notices out during this whole process so that the process of billing taxes has not been suspended at all uh, there is one tax billing that we have not activated yet and that is uh, the gap billing of registered motor vehicles and in my narrative on page two you can read some of the details about that the legislature mandated that process begin in July of 2017. However, for various reasons, we have not activated that program, uh, but we now are at a place and time in which we feel like it would behoove us to begin that process to bill uh, 
taxes on the gaps in the registrations. All of us know who have a registered motor vehicle that the taxes are calculated on, on the renewal notice on an annual basis for 12 months. For various reasons, as I point out in the memo, uh, there are situations where a taxpayer may let the registration lapse and so no taxes are collected on the vehicle during those lapsed months. So if we were to begin the process in the next, uh, next February when we propose to do it, um, we'd be billing approximately $1 million in value for, for each of the months that we, since, June, since July of 2017. The, the good news for the taxpayer here is that there would be no interest or no penalty associated with that delayed billing. And in fact, these bills, although they would be sent uh, next year, would not be due until September of 2021 and would not become delinquent until January 6th, 2022. So the legislature has uh, uh, provided a rather lengthy time to get these taxes paid. Are there any questions about that process before I continue? Commissioner Liner. Ronnie, if an individual takes the vehicle off the road, registration is expired for one reason or another, and just parks it in his backyard, doesn't operate it, doesn't do anything, say for eight months. After that, he either family member is old enough, wants to drive it, they let them drive it, and they want to bring it back. Are you saying they're going to have to pay that eight months that it's been sitting back there? Yes, because the, the taxes that were paid when it was registered were paid for the year. And if the registration expires for the, what, for the eight month period that you mentioned, then a new registration is applied for and the taxes on that vehicle would uh, apply for the following 12 months. So there's a gap in the, in the um, taxes, in the registration of the vehicle and the, and the tax uh, would not have been paid for those eight months. So the legislature created this mechanism whereby counties would be responsible for uh, billing and collecting those taxes on the gap in the registration, not DMV. I don't quite understand. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Legally, do you have, by statute, do you have to go back to 2017, or can we as a county decide when we go back? Well, I'll defer to the county attorney on that that matter, but I, if, from what I know, the legislature has has uh, off, has uh, mandated the county bill the taxes. Uh, counties that have billed them tell me that they have a lower collection percentage on those taxes than they do on regular taxes, but the law still requires that they be billed. Mr. Chair, may I have a question? Uh, if someone have three or four cars in their yard for years and years, do they count as a, a junk collector or do they have taxes on those cars? Well, they're, they're still taxable items and are required to be listed. And that's, if they're untagged, the law requires that they be listed in January of each year. Uh, they could be never registered again, but as long as they have some value, they're required to be listed. If a tag is ever put back on the vehicles, that's when the gap in the registration would, would kick in. Yeah, thank you. Go, Mr. Chairman, how many, I mean, are other counties actively doing this? Yes. So you, we, are, we are not, we're probably one of the few that are not at the present time. That's my understanding, yes. I think more than half the counties are, are billing those taxes. You know, I mean, it's like any of us when we receive a tax bill, and you know, especially from years back, um, it's going to make folks mad. There's no doubt about it. Um, how are we going to, Jack, how are we going to let the citizens know in advance of this rather than just springing a bill on them? 
a special uh, tax bill. The, the North Carolina Department of Revenue created a special <coughs> notice to taxpayers, which explains why they're getting the bill, and it gives all the, all the detail about why they're getting it, and it even tells the months that are covered by the bill and the reason for it. So they've done a good job of uh, explaining that to taxpayers. And in fact, we've got the bill ready to, to, to have had it ready to go for, for a while yet. But it's because of um, some deficiencies in our, our um, data processing and programming, which we have now cured. And when would we send that out? In February of next year is when we plan to start right. that activity. Commissioner Jones, uh, board, we're, we're, Ronnie's kind of talking about two separate issues. One is the, the tax collection remedies that we traditionally use, which are on pause, bringing those back in February of 2021, along with beginning the gap billing in February of 2021, which we feel comfortable with our new tax software. We're past Hurricane Florence, which has happened in this time past, some time past in COVID. I hope we're out of it, but there's no guarantees in that. So we think that coincide these both at the same time, Ronnie can be prepared from a customer service standpoint to deal with more calls uh, from a staffing standpoint and also be prepared, um, you know, to do some public information between now and then to let folks know this is coming. So it's not a surprise. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I may ask one more thing, because I just want to make sure, Ari, I'm asking this to you. We have no say. We cannot say, no, we do not go back to 2017. Mr. Jones, that's that's correct. It was a uh, bill passed by the General Assembly in 2013, and it's uh, mandated that the counties pursue this. It's not discretionary. Um, there you go. Mr. Uh, for the, the gap tax bills, I guess number one, my first question is, Do you, are these already prepared um, for those citizens in our county who might owe these gap taxes and second question for 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 our citizens what are the range in numbers are these you know 50 to 800 dollars are they 800 to 5000 dollars what kind of tax bills on average might people be able to expect that they would receive well depending on the number of months billed um, most of them were are relatively small in amount because some some most of the gaps are one two three or four months mm -hmm. on the outside there are some that are four years uh gap so that bill would be much higher um, the estimate we have is for a, a year's worth of bills is that there are approximately four thousand uh, of those bills and they total approximately seven thousand dollars per month so right. about eighty four thousand dollars a year right but i'm asking from a different perspective let us suppose i um i am a citizen and i've had a car sitting there for six months unregistered basic car not a maserati not a clunker ye old basic family car what might that kind of bill look like? Well, for example, a $10,000 vehicle, if it was in the city of New Bern and Craven County, the n normal tax bill would be about $100. So if it had a six-month lapse, it would be about $50 okay. for that vehicle. Um, so on the... Round numbers. So on average, for the for these citizens, um, we're looking at bills from 1000 and under. I, I'm trying... I, I'm trying to figure out, you know, what kind of tax bill might somebody get hit with? Getting hit with a $50 bill is different than getting hit with a $1,000 bill. I, I cannot imagine there'd be too many $1,000 bills there. I, I, I just can't imagine there'd be that many. Okay. There may be for an expensive uh, freight line or truck, but I don't think so. Okay. No. Um, I had a uh, car been sitting on my lot for oh, I mean, about three or four years, and my wife had given it to someone, and he had pulled off the lot, and the state man came up there and told told her that we would have to tell that guy he had to bring the 
the van back and put it back on the yard and not move it off no more. And it's been sitting up there right now. And she's been trying to find out what had happened. She had the towel and everything he had given to him and everything. So it's still sitting there. I, I can't I can't understand what what is going on. Well, these gap bills would, would be sent to the registered owner of the vehicle. So I'm not sure in that situation who, who the owner is, but whoever the registered owner is is who would get the bill. They, they tell us, it, it can't, it, you can't move it off the yard. That's why the guy, the, the guy from the highway patrol came up there and told us. I think it's more of a title issue. An ownership issue than a tax issue. She had the title. I think that's something you better take up privately with Mr. Antry. Yeah, I can. Okay, any other questions? Okay, Mr. Antry. The last thing I have to mention to you is the, you know that for a number of years, at least 20 years, maybe 25 years, Craven County has participated with the program of the Set-Off Debt Collection Act that is administered by the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners. And until February of last year, we were in the, uh, had a routine whereby we would send notices to delinquent taxpayers as they became delinquent uh, send them notices that any money they owed the county for taxes or any other debt uh, would be collected from any lottery winnings or state income tax refunds. We have not sent those notices out uh, for the la for over a year, about a year and a half now, and we think it's time to restart that process mm -hmm. because none of the 2019 taxes that are have been delinquent now for seven months or eight months uh, have been included in the program. This, you know, this is a matter of notifying taxpayers of the debt, and that if it's not taken care of by the time we begin enforcement remedies next year in February, that money could be collected from their income tax refund. So we. We, we uh, plan to restart that process as soon as is practical. What was the reason for not doing it? Well, we were getting ready to change the software, and I got you. So it, it just worked out better Mr. for Chairman, us. About the time that the software transition had gotten to a point where we were comfortable, the coronavirus hit. Yeah, I understand. And we were very reticent to do any remedies at that point. Okay. All right. Any other questions? So let me, can I just recap? So start the collection remedies February of 2021, gap billing in February of 2021, and turn over the properties to debt set off as soon as possible for the collection period beginning in February of 2021. That would be the three things we're notifying you tonight so you're aware when citizens ask you. Okay. Mr. Chair, if yes. I may. I know you made mention about educating the public, but can we get that flyer or that bill explaining the gap procedures? Can we get that out way before February so yes. it's not with the bill? I agree. Um, We'd like to go ahead and, and do it uh, frequently between, say, now and February. We'll work with Mr. Antry to make sure that we can work with our uh, PIO staff for that. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then we have a, a long session here. I think we should take a five-minute break. And that is planning, contract award recommendations, community development, block grant, neighborhood revitalization. Chip Bartlett. Good evening, everyone. Um, tonight we have before you contract award recommendations for the CDBGNR program or neighborhood revitalization. We got a bid opening for the rehabilitation and elevation of two storm damaged owner occupied homes included in this program. 
back in the end of July, uh, bid proposals were received from two contractors, Dozier Built LLC of Raleigh and Paul Willard Construction of Greenville. Um, we are recommending rehabilitation contract awards to the low bidder in both cases. First address is 125 Chips Road in Vanceboro to Dozier Built LLC for a low bid, low bidder, uh, $137,600. Second address is 8,000 River Road, Vanceboro. Low bidder was Paul Willard Construction at $146,816. Prompt approval of this, these contract awards are needed to allow us to move forward with assistance to these storm damage, or excuse me, flood damage homes. Please note that these contracts aw contract awards are also contingent on approval from the funding agency to perform substantial rehab since they do involve rehab and elevation. That request has already been made to the Rural Economic Development Division. Uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions um, you may have regarding these contract award recommendations Chair. tonight. Um, Chip, yes, sir. just to be clear, this CDBG NR program came about because of Hurricane Matthew. Correct. Yes, so for the board, I think this is important because I want to thank Don and Chip and Holland Consulting and the planning staff for hanging with this for four years. We've been working with the state to get those folks here. I wish the audience was still here, and I hope the folks at home know that this storm, Matthew, went unnoticed in this county by a lot of folks and across the state. It was devastating certain people in Craven County, particularly in the River Road and Chip's communities. And uh, Don and his staff and Chip with Holland have worked impeccably hard uh, to get these folks some help. And it hasn't been easy. We've had to create a whole new state agency just to deal with the money. We dealt with three state agencies prior to that agency being set up, trying to get this money to the citizens where it needed. These folks have been displaced in our county for four years. So I'm, I'm Don, thank you for, for hanging with us. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think that uh, Commission, uh, Commissioner Jay, uh, Vice Chairman Jones and myself are happy about this. I mean, it's been going on for four years, and there's still some more people out there like this. That's right. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? <coughs> Being no discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Nays? The ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next is the Craven County Schools resolution to approve a lease for technology equipment. Stacy Lee. Good evening, Chairman Mark, Vice Chairman Jones, and Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, in fiscal year 2015-16, the Board of Commissioners began to provide a separate appropriation to the Board of Education for the purchase of learning devices for our students. Craven County Schools is now at the end of that original three-year lease. So we're requesting um, a refresh of the initial devices. Craven County Schools um, selected I Apple iPads for the students in the original lease, and the administration has determined to continue with Apple iPads for this refresh. The refresh proposal will provide 7,100 devices for all students attending traditional 6 through 12 schools in the amount of $3,559,557.57, or $889,849.40 per year. Um, I did want to point out that these devices, I think um, you may have heard earlier some short shortcomings we have with the devices was keyboards. These devices will come with a rugged case and keyboard combination as part of our continuous improvement taking input from students, teachers, and others as far as how to improve the devices. They will also come with Apple Care, which is the repair process that Apple provides for the devices. Um, these devices will be, the screen size on these devices is 10.2 inches and 32 gigs of memory. Um, the Board of Education is requesting the adoption of the attached resolution Exhibit C as shown in Attachment 9 authorizing and improving the execution and delivery of a master lease purchase agreement shown in attachment 9.1 and approving the execution and delivery of schedule number two to the master lease purchase agreement shown in attachment 
And this is no new money. This is within the budget that's already been appropriated to Craven County Schools. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I'd just like to make one comment that was made by one of the people that spoke and said that because of the computers that we're using, uh, they're not getting the same education as other schools. Uh, that's state software, and it's the same software in all the computers. So uh, I can't see how that would matter, but I just want to make sure everybody understands that it's the software, mm -hmm. not the computer that teaches the child. Okay. Um, can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Discussion. Commissioner Liner. Stacy, I guess I'm the one that's going to start this. I got quite a few questions, so Mr. Chair, cut me off if somebody else wants to come in here. I might. Huh? <laughs> uh, why only 71? 7,100 during this? It's only for students 6 through 12. Okay, That's but when, we, when we did this last in, in 16, it was for about 999000 or whatever, less than a million dollars. And it was for everybody, grades, grades K through 12 was that package. What's happening through the K through the fifth graders? There be, we're using title funding to um, service those students in the K-5 space. Title funding? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, what's the difference between this computer you're getting now and the computers that you've got in process now? What I'm getting at, <coughs> my Apple iPad is almost six years old, mm -hmm. and it works fine and does great. These that you've got now are only three years old, just coming up on the third year. Why, why are we changing out? and buy it all new other than having, this one has the keyboard and it has the service contract. Right. But would it not be, I mean, give me the logic of why after three years we totally replace them now. Part of what you look at, um, Commissioner Liner, when you're looking at refreshes on leases is the residual value of the device that you're hopefully going to sell back. So somewhere between the three and four year period, the residual device, the residual <clears throat> value device is pretty good, pretty high. And our plan is to take those devices, assuming the refresh is approved, once we collect those devices back, we'll sell those devices back to a vendor, we'll get money, and then we put that money back in to staff refreshes. So we'll be able to get new devices for staff as well. You're exactly right. I mean, the, the length of life of a device is getting longer, and that's why this lease is actually for four years, so we're going to extend that for the fourth year. But what you don't want to do is jeopardize all the residual value in the device so you can get some of that money back to hopefully put that in to buy other devices going forward. Hopefully that makes sense. I follow you, but now you opened up another question that was following on, the residual value. Now... My understanding, and please anybody in this room correct me, but when we did this, this was a lease package mm -hmm. that we didn't own them, that we were gonna, they were going to be bought back by Apple. Now I understand that's not true. We own them, and you're going to put them out for bids as a package. They're not going back necessarily to Apple. Is that correct? That's correct. So who's making the determination of what the residual value is? <coughs> and... What if it comes under? What if it comes back way under what your residual value that you think should be? Well, it, there's a process that we have to follow. I mean, the first step is the board has to declare the um, device as a surplus, and then we go through a bidding process. Um, we have to do upset bidding process is a very prescribed process that we have to go through, and then. We're given some indication going in what these vendors think the value of these devices are, and they actually give us a guarantee not to go below value. So they'll tell us you're going to get X thousands of dollars as part of this process. So there is some level of guarantee through this process on how much money we're actually going to get back. Okay, then that leads me to the next one. Since we own them, and you're going to bid them all out under one contract or whatever, 
the existing contract that you're ordering in now mm -hmm. is basically the same contract that you put forward in 16, is it not? We're yeah. leasing them to <coughs> own them. That's correct. We're not leasing them to sell back to Apple. We, not necessarily becoming, I mean, Apple could be the high bidder on it, mm -hmm. but it's not guaranteed that Apple is going to take these back at a residual value already established. No, sir. No, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Anybody else want to jump in? <clears throat> yes. Um, Mr. Lee, I, I was not here when the current devices were approved and that contract was done three years ago, four right. years ago. And I was so, not either, Commissioner Booker. So. Um, my question, <clears throat> I got a couple of questions. One is, if, if we were to check with the surrounding school districts, such as Carteret or Jones or Pamlico, what brand of device would they be using? Uh, Jones, Lenore, and Green County are 100% Apple, some of the surrounding counties. Um, there's about 90% of the school districts in North Carolina have some level of Apple product. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's, you know, A to Z Apple, but they'll either have staff devices, some level of grade will have an Apple product, but about 90% of the school districts <coughs> in North Carolina have Apple products deployed. Um. 90% you said have some Apple. Some Apple. But, but not necessarily the students. There's a com most, Some of them have students. Some of them have students in, say, grades K-3 and not K-12. Um, some of them have staff devices. So it's a different combination of the okay. deployment. Is there, um, you're, you're not, a tech, mm -hmm. not a technical person, but why Apple? What I'm just curious as to why Apple... Apple doesn't appear to me to be, Apple appears to me in corporate, et cetera, is, is the minority, right. clearly, um, at least where I came from. Uh, it, n nope, we didn't use Apple. We, we used the... Used PCs. Yeah. Right. So why Apple? What, what, what's the reason that we <clears throat> went with Apple, and do we need to go back? Is there a reason why... I guess once you go with Apple now, you're kind of stuck, aren't you? Um, you, you really, once you make the decision, you, you don't want to change if you don't have to. To answer your question, you get, you get a lot of familiarity, you get a lot of momentum with the device that you have. And have to go back and retrain, you need to consider that. Um, I spent 20 plus years in corporate, and everybody always says Apple wasn't a big play in corporate, and that's exactly right. But it wasn't so much the hardware selection, it was more about Microsoft because Microsoft was the corporate play that everybody used. Yep. And Apple didn't support Microsoft at the time. So you really didn't have an option to do Apple. Some, some companies did. It's becoming much more common now. Um, it's becoming a more common platform. The advantages that the hardware itself ha um, has, and I appreciate um, Chairman Mark's comment about it's not so much the hardware, it's what you use the hardware for and how you teach and things like that. But the hardware itself has advantages in security, the mobility piece. It's fully integrated, and by that what I mean is it's a hardware, software, and application built into one. Where sometimes with a PC you can't necessarily do that. You have to sort of build as you go. In Apple, it comes all together. So hopefully that helps a little bit. So Carteret does not use Apple. I, I don't think so. Okay. All right. That so. answers my question. But Jones Green and um, Lenore do. All right. One There's of the some other, other districts in the western part of the state. One of the other advantages of an apple is that it has less chance of viruses. Correct. Yeah, it's much more secure in the way it's provisioned. And without <coughs> getting too technical, it's a Linux base, and it, it's just easier to keep it secure. Uh, Commissioner E.T.? Did you have another question? No. Um, with it, I have a question and then a comment. Are th I think are these apples, iPads that the um, students are getting? Are they going to operate pretty much the same as the apples that they already have? Um, y yes, ma'am. They they'll operate pretty much the same that the ones are they have now with the addition of the keyboard. A traditional keyboard. Okay, but so the students are, are using one system and if they get a new system they know how to work it. Absolutely. The new one because they used could work the old Absolutely. one. Absolutely. Yes, okay, and we know it's compatible with everything that we're already doing. 
uh, that was one of my comments mm -hmm. is um, tablets, iPads, Chromes, etc. They're not dishwashers where you can plug in a Bosch and you can plug in a GE, but they pretty much work the same. Um, hardware and software always has glitches, problems, and everything that's got a learning curve associated with it. Um, <clears throat> with everything we've got going on now with schools, virtual, lack of broadband, students, grandparents, parents trying to do essentially homeschooling in some form or fashion with the assistance of the Board of Education. I do not believe that it is in the best interest of our students to be switching platforms in the middle of this school year. Um, we've got enough problems now without adding a learning curve <coughs> of a new platform to it um, when they don't have access to the IT department, to teachers, or in many cases adults to assist them with it. Um, they are dependent on these right now. That's all I got. Mr. Chairman, I, this come up so fast, I haven't even really had the chance to tell them much. Spending this kind of money, I don't want to rush in to something that might cost us more money. And I, I'm for putting it off of, I'm, I'm for putting this off a while till we can study this more so we can get more information because I'm, I'm not a computer expert, but from, from, from talking to certain people, they say they're having a lot of problems with the Apple product. I don't know where they're having problems or who having problems or what, but I like to be able to kind of research and see what is going on. This that was dropped right in our lap. There's a lot of money to be spending. Just within, I say within two weeks, that, and they're not even studying the situation. And, and I'm, I'm waiting on this and get some more information on it. Well, one of the problems we have, Commissioner, is that uh, we have a short period of time here. <clears throat> for us to go out and go to other companies at this point would be uh, kind of hard. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I may ask a question to you. Um, if, let's just say if the Board of Commissioners decided not to act on this lease right now. I mean, you've stated here in your comments tonight that um, the school system will own, well, we own the, the product. Uh, if we could take and wait a while, could we possibly um, sign a, the, a <coughs> service agreement to give us a little more time? I mean, I think it's been stated here, and I think, and you correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, right. but um, the devices are working currently, correct? Yes, sir. If we could uh, have a service agreement with them to give this board a little more time to look at the situation that we've got. I mean, I agree with Commissioner Sampson in, in what he's saying. This Board of Commissioners, if we decide to do this, you know, we're, we're, we want to make sure that the young folks of this county, the students of this county, don't miss a beat. We want them to have everything they've got to have for this remote learning. I mean, that's our that's a number one priority of ours, just as it would be with the Board of Education. <coughs> But if nothing would change, if things could continue on like they're going at the present time, I mean, we're committing not only uh, another board of commissioners, because this board will be up in 2022, we're committing another board of education. Uh, the board of Education has elections this year. Um, to we're making a decision that may not be the desire of a new Board of Education. It may not be the desire of another Board of Commissioners. And I think by us jumping and, you know, and committing to four years, we do have to give it some thought. So I'm going back to my question. Okay. I said a lot of things in between. Will it cause any disruptions with what we're doing at the present time? Um, Vice Chairman Jones, disruption probably not, but the longer we wait, the less residual we have in the devices. So the less we'll be able to do with the buyback process. And we were fully anticipating to have enough funds from the buyback process to actually upgrade our teacher devices, which haven't been upgraded in the three years as well. 
and, and we were trying to become a lot more routine in the updating process because prior to these leases being in place, my understanding was, you know, you had teacher devices that could be six, seven, eight years old. You have student devices that could be that old as well. And you really don't want to get in that cycle. You want to st keep this thing routine. Um, I appreciate your comments that we're extending this out to other boards and other, but right now given where we are with remote learning um, I, I truly believe the right thing to do is go ahead and move forward get the newer devices out there make sure that we don't have any because you're going to start seeing hardware issues the longer we keep them out there that's just obvious get the um, process to where we get those collected and recycled and i think that's the best thing for our students if i may ask too you made the comment um i think when commissioner liner asked you about um, um questions about the current ones and you said that the Board of Education would then take and vote to put them out for surplus right. and then they would go out for a bid process with the package that you presented here mm -hmm. from Apple was this bidded out to well, the 7100 iPads um, it, it does not have to be bidded out because it's single source I, Apple's the only company that does the iPads and through um, advice from our attorney, the single source letter was adequate. And they're also under state contract. Apple's also under state contract. So as long as this contract or lease wasn't in conflict with the state contract, which it was not, then we're OK. OK. Does that answer? <coughs> yes, yes, that, that's good. <clears throat> Commissioner Liner. You've you brought up some other questions for me other than the ones I've already still got here. Uh, of the 7100 that you're replacing, you brought up the issue of hardware issues. How many hardware issues are you having right now? Um, not anything that's out of the ordinary for the age device that we have. You normally run about 5 to 7% repair, which is what we're seeing. Um, on any, any hardware deployment, that's about what you're going to see as far as repair. Now, about five to seven percent i don't recall under the old contract but it was is apple repairing those or are you paying to have those repaired you're paying to have those you're repaired, repairing yes. to have those repaired and that's why we went with the apple care the 49 dollars gives you six repair um, opportunities <clears throat> over the three-year period okay let's get into my other question <clears throat> here uh and it was leading to what commissioner jones was saying the existing iPads that we have today, mm -hmm. if we do not fill this contract right now, Apple doesn't shut them down. Is that correct? I mean, they're still out there. They're still operational. They still have everything on them. Oh, yes, sir. Right. So they're still they're still good. The kids still have them, other than not having a keyboard, and the possibility mm -hmm. of our seven percent functions going up to maybe fourteen percent. No, one thing that you, we delay. One, one thing that you do face, though, is when you do generational updates in product, the operating system, if you go to a Generation 7 and you're on 6s, the Generation 6 device will not take the current software. Right. So we run the jeopardy of not being able to keep the operating system updated because of the hardware. They'll still work. It's much like PC products did with Windows conversions and things like that. But you will not get the up, you will not be able to upgrade to the latest version of their operating system at some point. That, that opens up a whole nother bag of worms because <laughs> the way things are updating, I mean, if you're in six and going to seven, I mean, normally it's a two or three year period under the old systems. Right. You know, you still had access and they still maintain working. Mm -hmm. So, I'm, I mean, we're not saying just because we're going from six to a seven, that's still six is going to be doing all the functions it wants to do for at least 18 months. I mean, you won't be able to add the system, but to be able to do everything that's in there and what you're teaching and everything now. Is that It'll correct? be able to continue what it's doing now. Okay. My last question, Mr. Chair. Why are we going to purchase new computers or laptops or whatever they're going to be for the teachers when we just gave them two years ago all new computers and laptops? Two years ago. Well, it, was, it came in after the kids got them because they all had to go to training. And we remember because we went to 
was two thousand. All of eighteen. Yeah, we went to all of the schools to where we presented all of these. So why are we doing this again? Well, two years later. Part of this will take it will take time to get the staff devices to where we can actually refresh them, because I mean the the lead time on these devices now. Um, the student devices will probably not ship until October, 1st of November at the earliest. We collect those, we get them in, and then we go through the buyback process on the other devices. So then those teacher devices would be entering into their third year of life. So it's going to take us a while to get there. I'll tell you what, you've got a better system going than we do in the county because Jack don't buy his people not until five years or six years. I mean, that's just the way it is. And I guess my last one, and I'll, I'll geez, I think I lost it. Uh, teachers just purchase. No, I, I've lost my train on that one. That's enough. I mean, I don't know. Mr. Oh, Chair, I have one more, and it's an yeah. it's the topic of delaying has been raised. Um, I'm going to assume that title funds were not available three years ago for the K through five years, or they would have been used at the time. I, I would assume so. Okay. So my question is, if we delay this contract, um, at what point do we jeopardize receiving title funding for K through 12 computers? The the title funding is only K through five. Right, but is it only for this year, or is it going to be extended for next year? The title lease runs one more year for K five. For K five. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. That was my question. Mm -hmm. um, but, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yeah. Okay, but far as the K through five, those um, devices that you have now, they will not be upgraded until when. It'll be next year. Next year. Right. Through the title funding. That's what we're hoping. What you're hoping for, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, a question was brought up about why uh, the uh, addition of the, I, I, is the pen included in that for writing on the iPad? It is not. Okay. Uh, but the ability to type is. Correct. The keyboard is included, yes, sir. The keyboard uh, is valuable in some cases to our special needs people. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's one reason to have the keyboard, um, because in some cases they can't just use the regular iPad. Uh, I did some research on that, and uh, that was one of the things that came out on it. Just wanted to mention that for reasons for having the keyboard. Okay. Any uh, also, if I, if I may, Mr. Chair, bringing that forward and everything else, I mean, I know what you're saying and, and going through, and I wholeheartedly concur. I mean, the public out there thinks that we're spending money left and right, we're going through this. And I had a lot of questions, a lot of concerns, but if you really look at it, at the amount of money that we're paying to lease them is $125 a year for each computer or each laptop. Correct. Which gives us the serve six service things during the lifetime of that on that. It gives us all the charging stations. It gives us all the other support that comes with it, which is basically, if you look at it, it's free. So $125 averages over four years is 500 On a computer nowadays, right now, at Walmart, is going for about 780 with no service contract or anything else other than your warranty package. Right. <clears throat> and my only, Mr. Lee, my only question is where, because I'm just, I understand what you're saying in this package and what your board did when they said that the school board could go this alone because they have the funding. Yes, they have the funding because we gave you that funding in this year's budget to pay for the existing contract. Right. But my concern is, is what's going to happen next year or the following years if either that board or this board cuts that funding or does away with that funding, does the school board still have enough to stand alone to pay that bill? 
Mr. Liner, I mean, that would be something that we would have to look at at the time. Um, we, would, we would see the importance in continuing this in that I'm positive that funding would be available. I, I don't know how to speculate where that would come from, but given the importance of where we are right now with our student learning and this being an integral part of that, I'm, I'm confident the board, would, the board of Education would find funding to continue it. Mr. Chair, why I've got him here it has nothing to do with what we're getting ready to vote for. One of our... Oh, this is school nutrition, no? <laughs> no. This is one of the people brought up. Why is it taking... Why is the flash drives one week behind other students? Flash drives oh, one are, week behind a other students. A citizen came up here complaining that they can't get on the internet or anything else, and they're getting flash drives, but the flash drive is a week behind the other students that's online. Um, Mr. Liner, I'll have to investigate that. It should not be. Um, it depends on where they're picking or coming to get the flash drive or making arrangements to pick up the flash drive. But the flash drive should be current to whatever the teacher is providing at that time. Would you mind getting back with that? I think I, <clears throat> can I phrase it just a little differently? I think what the parent was suggesting was that their student is a week behind because they're doing a week's worth of work on a flash drive than downloading it. So if there was an issue, their student wouldn't note it till there was a week had passed. That's the way I took it. I could be yeah. okay. taking that statement wrong. But it still puts them behind. Right. Correct. Yes, sir. Yeah. But I'm, I'm more than happy to take that back and take a look at that. That should not be the case. Thank you, sir. And I heard the, all the, the Bound East issues, and we're fully aware of those. We have 794 hotspots deployed. We had 380 more that arrived today. Um, so we're, we're, we're feeling the pain as well, and we're trying to do all that we can to make sure these students are taken care of. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Discussion? <clears throat> do I have a motion? You already got one. Got we one. have a motion and a second. You already okay. got a motion and a second. All right. Uh, can I have a roll call vote, please? Sure. Commissioner Sampson? No. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. Commissioner McCabe? No. Commissioner Liner? Yes. Commissioner Booker? Yes. Vice Chairman Jones? No. Chairman Mark? Yes. I believe we have a pass. Yep, four three. Thank you so much. <clears throat> that was close. Water department. Uh, Gene Hodges, Al Gerard, Craig Warren. We brought the whole county to talk about these couple of items, didn't we? Um, I do have the engineer on the phone on my cell phone here, so if we've got any technical questions, uh, we'll be able to pull Chris in. Um, when Hurricane Florence struck Craven County, the Lawson Creek pump station was irreparably damaged. This pump station is a subsurface vault containing pumps, pipes, valves, and electrical controls that interconnects under the river the two water systems that Craven County operates. This pump is critical in Craven County's plan to reduce the amount of water that is drawn out of the Black Creek Aquifer per the state of North Carolina regulations. On June 17, 2019, the Craven County Board of Commissioners selected CGS Conveyance LLC as the engineer to design and oversee the repairs to this critical component of our water system. A considerable amount of design work and hydrological modeling has been performed and there are still several months of design work yet to be completed. The first phase of the project, which we're talking about tonight, will entail the fabrication and installation of an interim bypass pump that will be put in place while the final design and construction of the repairs are underway. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a seeing as a, a picture is worth a thousand words. I've got a couple of pictures here so everybody's aware of what we're talking about on this project. Um, so just for, let me get it on cone here. Okay, so just for familiarity, the Lawson Creek pump station is located on, of course, by Lawson Creek, and you would access it through the Lawson Creek Park that the city of uh, the city of Newburn holds. Our pump station is circled in red. So just to put this in perspective, we are looking at this is where the uh, Blue Angels jet is, out there on right off of Highway 70. 
Uh, the next photograph is what you're looking at inside of the. I'm leaving my noggin out of the way. What you're looking at here is the actual inside of this pump, and that is the second day after the storm. Second day, yes, sir. Second day after the storm. You're not supposed to see water in that bottle. <laughs> Um, and this water is probably over all of our heads if we had to guess. Um, after the water drains out, this took, and this actually had, the sump pumps were doing everything they could to get the water out. It was only after the water table lowered that this was able to drop down that you could actually see what was, all, all this is what was submerged underwater. And then just to put it in perspective, like we said, this is in the ground. So that's why this was all so critical. And it's the interconnection between the two systems. You can see this is the level of all the electrical components that were all also submerged in water. Um, more items inside that same vault. Mm -hmm. This is the chemical building that is also located on the site. Now this is at grade. This was also underwater because of course you can see where the road comes in at. And you can see how this is still, is still uh, graded up, but it was still submerged underwater when the Hurricane Florence came in. And you're going to hear us talk about an interim bypass pump. This is a model of what was spec'd out when the bids were put together. So this is what, when I'm talking about an interim bypass pump, this orange piece of equipment here is what we're going to be talking about. So a request for proposal RFP was issued on July 23rd, 2020. A virtual pre-bid meeting was held on August the 5th and responses were received on August the 12th. The base bid included rental of a bypass pump and the alternate proposal was to purchase the pump. Four firms submitted bids with Jones and Smith Contractors LLC of Aiden producing the lowest bid of $273,763. Their alternate proposal of purchasing the pump reduced the price by $48,000 for a total proposal of $225,763. CGS Conveyance performed reference checks on the firm and all references received were positive. The recommendation from CGS Conveyance is to award the project to Jones and Smith contractors in the amount of $225,763. There's a letter of recommendation, a contract award, and a detailed bid tabulation included in your packet. There's also a budget amendment and a project ordinance in the amount of $803,763 that establishes and funds this project. This amount's broken down as follows. Engineering fees of $548,000. Now that is the estimate for the entire project, not just this phase. That's the estimate from the engineer to take this to final completion. Uh, the construction of the 225-763 that uh, we just spoke about that were in the bids. There's a, a line for construction other than general $7,000. There's some maintenance that the water department will need to conduct because this water in this line has been sitting there for three, uh, three years now, just about. So that's all got to get flushed out and get cleaned and rechlorinated before you put this pump into action and, and letting it work. And then uh, we typically put in a 10% contingency based on the construction price. So that's why the total amount is $803,763. Um, the request will be for the board to approve the project ordinance amendment and the budget amendment in that amount to fund this project and to authorize the county manager to execute the agreement with Jones and Smith for this phase of the repairs to the Lawson Creek booster pump station. I'm I have a motion. So move. Second. I have a motion and a second. Do I have any discussion? I have a question. Commissioner Booker? Okay. Um, I'm looking at the numbers. I, I see where the 803-763 comes from. Okay, but when I'm looking at the budget amendment, it's um, 1.6 million. Yes, sir. Our esteemed finance director could explain, but you have to budget the transfer from the fund into the project. So you're, you have to budget the same item twice because you have to budget the transfer and then budget the expenditure. Okay, so so it's not really 1.6. It's not. It's, that's why it's we were really clear. Eight hundred thousand. It's eight hundred thousand, but you have to show the amendment. You have to show it coming in and out of the funds. Okay, that no. That half is coming from the water fund into the project fund, which makes it look like it's doubled up, but it's really. But it's not really doubled. Correct. I'm happy. Okay. Commissioner Booker. Gene, I know this is probably a question that doesn't need to be asked, but I want to make sure. We're, we're, we are proposing the engineering to put this, put us in a position where 
if we get another hurricane that brings water in at the same level. It's not going to it's, it's going to be raised. It's not going to destroy it again. Correct. For the for the final part of the project, when you have the final completion, it is going to be elevated. It's going to be elevated, I mean, even more elevated than it is now. And have they told us what the preliminary, what their grading is on it? Because I know we had a high water mark on it. It was the same as it was a lot of downtown areas, about 10 feet. It was 10 or 10.5, uh, 10 and a half feet, I think they're going to try to go at least, at least yeah. All right. That's all. I I remember that discussion, but I just want to make sure that before we go and say we're going to spend this kind of money, that we are going to assure ourselves that an equal storm isn't going to cause us to be shut down. Again. So what this phase does is when you put this piece of equipment in, is this what lets you start to balance the system and flow the water? It's a temporary, me not temporary, but it's a it's an interim measure in order to, to then let the, let the process work so the permanent repairs could be done. Yeah, understand. So, and then and ultimately it will see, you're gonna see a, a, a structure there that's gonna be elevated. The uh, airport, uh, it's not gonna cause a problem with <laughs> Let's <the> hope not. <laughs> Commissioner Booker, I joke at times, it's gonna look like a lighthouse when you enter Lawson Creek Park, because it's gonna be the one <laughs> thing sent in there, so. Commissioner Liner. Yeah, so as Craig has pointed out, is that once this is purchased, then we've got, you know, and, and, and the permanent work is finally done, the final completion, then this pump is able to be used if you have another emergency somewhere down the road at another time. So we, 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 we're going to own that. We're going to own that. That's why we bid it two ways. One as a rental and one as a purchase, and the purchase was about $50,000 cheaper. Gene, where, where are we standing at with FEMA on this project? This is a FEMA project from Florence. So where are we standing at on this? I want to ask the finance director to step so in on this. this um, we are in discussion with FEMA on this particular project, um, along with the mitigation. So all those discussions are still taking place. I think we're about six months away from the permanent plans. Once we supply those, then we can have uh, more permanent discussions. But everything so far is is being discussed. Uh, nothing's been said no to at this time. Um, so well, they're starting it over three times. <laughs> yeah, and the um, <laughs> uh, as far as the insurance proceeds, uh, this this particular asset is in a flood zone, and our deductible for that is uh, about half a million dollars. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. <clears throat> we have a motion. Second. Let me have a roll call vote on this, please. Sorry. Commissioner Sampson? Yes. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. Commissioner McCabe? Yes. Commissioner Liner? Yes. Commissioner Booker? Yes. Vice Chairman Jones? Yes. Chairman Mark? Yes. Thank you. Hey. Next is a is uh, appointments. No, no, nope. and your write-offs. Got your write-offs. Oh, I forgot yeah, about that. Yeah. yeah. I'd rather be talking about the engineering folks. I'll do this too. <clears throat> um, I'm Al Gerard. I know y'all haven't seen me in a while. Um, I guess all this. We still happen. recognize you. <laughs> all right, so I'm good. <clears throat> um, each January, the Water Department begins its annual bad debt write-off process by identifying uncollected account balances that exceed the collection period of four years. And some of you probably remember doing this a couple of years ago to get it started. <clears throat> um, as of December 31st, 2019, there were 111 customers' accounts with the balances totaled. This has to be corrected. It was $23,770.25. 770? Yes, rather than 23,700. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> that accrued the final bill between January 1st of 2015 and December 31st of 2015. Uh, these accounts have exceeded the collection period deemed uh, reasonably acceptable by generally accepting <clears throat> accounting uh, principles. <clears throat> Air Force requested that the board consider approving the write offs of these water fund receivables. Which, and I think we did an attachment in there. Um, yeah. Attachment number 10B. So we're asking that you give us approval to do these write offs. 
I have a motion. So moved. Second. A motion is second. Any discussion? Mr. Chair. Yes. Now, is there, do you have a procedure, a policy, or something down there? Jack, you may be more about this than I do. We're writing these off for these 111. Is there some way, you know, somebody comes back in next year or so, or even this year, to check and see their name is not on this, that we don't rehook them up, or they come back into the area and want to set up water? <clears throat> Once we write this off, we don't have the authority to go back if they come back into the area? Yeah. Well, just because you write it off doesn't mean you don't you stop trying to collect it, right? So Mr. Antry talked to you about debt set off and programs like that, which we would still use for this type of debt. So if someone just by instance owed us uh, an example, $115, they won the lottery for 1000 we collect our $115 first, and they get the proceeds. That's not a pleasant phone call to get as a county manager when someone drove to Raleigh and we intercepted their lottery winnings. That's happened a couple times. But I think um, – Jessica or Al, I believe we do keep track of this. And if someone was to come want a new account, and they're on this list. They've got to bring it back to a hole before we would authorize them a, a new account. That's correct. And, yeah. and, and while I got a second, too, I, I want to introduce you all to Jessica Martinez, who's our new uh, customer service supervisor. <clears throat> We've been working together uh, for the last few months, and I've been very happy with with what she's done. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in fact, I, I, I kind of anticipated that there may be a question that would come up tonight. So we were looking at some stuff today on this little thing. It's, called, it's online utilities. You may have heard this before. I, I know we were talking to a girl in uh, Havelock that used these folks. And it says, we eliminate bad debt. And it's your total solution for eliminating bad debt and recover your money now. Now, when I came here from Pamico County, we did the same thing that we do here. We basically write, write off anything $50 or less because most collection agencies don't want to take the trouble of trying to collect for the number of people that owe the small amount of money that's owed. Now, I, have, I just got this today, but I do want to look into it a little bit more. And if there's something there that we might be interested in, I'll, I'll talk to Jack about it Friday, and we'll bring it back to you because I've, I've had that question before. And I never had a good answer for it. So I'm, I feel like we're moving in the direction that we should be on that one, too. But, but we are protected as far as somebody getting put off and we write this off and then they come back in and they want to try to hook it back up. We'll, we'll figure out who they are. So that, that's that kind of answer. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the write-off of water receivables? You have a motion. Yeah. We have a motion. We have a second. Yeah. Okay. Can I have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Sampson? Yes. Commissioner Mitchell? Yes. Commissioner McCabe? Yes. Commissioner Liner? Yes. Commissioner Booker? Yes. Vice Chairman Jones? Yes. Chairman Mark? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate you pointing that out. Sorry about that. That's okay. It, it was it was a it was a counting error. <laughs> That's what it's doing. Thank you. See you. Okay. See you. Take care, Al. Thanks. Okay. That brings us to appointments. Appointments will be effective immediately. Otherwise, pending appointments. Adult Care Home Advisory Committee, Graven Aging Planning Board, Graven Pamico Regional Library Board, Lynn Gonzalez, resignation. Now, do we have uh, in Vanceboro any uh, appointments that have to be made? Not in Vanceboro, but you and I have been talking about it and working okay. on it. Okay, we we'll work on that. Nursing Home Advisory Committee, Regional Aging Advisory Board. Still working on those. Okay. Senior. The senior is going to be on hold because they're not meeting, so. Okay, we'll put that one on hold. And then we got the Voluntary Agricultural District Advisory Board, District 6. Let me just say something on that one. If anybody has anybody that they'd like to see that, it's got a business either in forestry or agricultural, they'd like to put it. I just don't have in anybody in my area. Okay. 
I, if anybody does, a, uh, I guess it would be Commissioner Jones and myself, uh, or uh, maybe Theron. Okay. Okay. Coastal Regional uh, Airport Board. Mr. Chairman, we're going to bring that up at the next meeting, I think. Okay. Current Adult Care Home Advisory Committee, Nancy Verzier, District 1 sales appointment. I would, she's looking for reappointment. I would reappoint her. Upcoming terms expiring Adult Care Home Advisory Committee, Linda Shagnon, Fire Tax Commission Board, Rolf Morris, May, Maris, uh, Alton Riggs, uh, com that's District 7, Fireman Relief Fund Board of Trustees, Robert Stroud, District 3, and Felix Groom, District 3, Barnwell, Craven County Clean Sweep Committee, Pat Sager and Joan Campbell. Next is the County Attorney's Report. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, I have uh, four items for your consideration this morning or this afternoon. Um, I guess it is almost this morning, but uh, the first three items uh, deal with county-owned property acquired through the tax foreclosure process. The first parcel is located on uh, Church Road uh, in Havelock with a parcel ID number of 6054029. Um, we've received an offer in the amount of $1,000. Uh, the past due taxes and the cost of foreclosure were $2,420.30, and the tax value of the property is $31,240. Um, the necessary documents to approve this transaction uh, are in your agenda packet. I will note with the relatively low bid, um, this will go through the upset bid process, so we may very well receive a competing bid for it. Um, and the county is not obligated to accept this even after that process. So. Mr. Chair, before yes. you take a ask for a motion or on that, I, I would like to ask this board to authorize the manager to put a sale sign on this piece of property. This piece of property was looked at online. This is in a, it's on Church Road, but it's in a residential area. And the last piece of property down there sold for over $10,000 on this vacant lot just like this is. I was on that lot Friday. It's a nice piece of property right on Church Road. I, I don't know the people that's put in the bid, but $1,000 for that piece of property I is, agree. is not, is not, good at all and we haven't even advertised it we've had it for seven or eight years I think it's time if there's interest we put it out there put a price on it to, to sell it but not not to take this type of if that's you know that's what I would recommend this board do mm -hmm. oh, that's a good idea great yep. If that's the pleasure of the board, um, there's really no action required. We want to uh, adopt the resolution, and we'll let the uh, bidder know that it's going to be advertised, and we'll go from there. Is that all you need from us? Yes, sir. Thank you, board. Um, the second parcel is uh, located at 257 Streets Ferry Road in Vanceboro. It's got a parcel ID number of 1046059. Uh, we've got a bid in the amount of $1,500 with the past due taxes and the foreclosure costs totaling $1,530.53. The tax value of the property is $12,000. Um, the documents necessary to move this forward into the upset bid process are in your agenda packet if the board is inclined to approve it. Vice Chairman Jones. Gordon's with that. Do I have a motion? So move. Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. 
the third and last par parcel is another initial offer to purchase uh, on Muddy Lane in Newburn with a parcel ID number of 1044303. Um, we have a offer amount of $1,000 with tax foreclosure costs and past due taxes of $1,135.58. And the tax value of the parcel was $4,050. Uh, the resolution and related documents necessary to move this forward are enclosed in the agenda packet. Okay. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Hayes, the ayes have it. Um, the fourth item is a mutual aid agreement between Craven County and the City of New Bern, basically for the um, 911 call centers. <clears throat> this came from the um, City of New Bern uh, folks. It's basically a continuation of agreement that's been in place for many years. It offers uh, redundancy and backup uh, in case one center goes down or if there's issues with one center, the other center will uh, step into the breach and uh, make sure those emergency services are available. Um, the city suggested, and I would concur with the suggestion, that instead of each board um, affirmatively rene renewing this every year or two or three, we just make it automatically renewing uh, going forward. We can still cancel it if we need to get out of it. It's, uh, it's not that we're locked into it. Um, it'll just uh, save um, a little bit of administrative freight, as I would call it, on an agreement that I think uh, everybody would like to have in place as long as we can. Um, it's our recommendation, my recommendation, that the board consider adopting this agreement. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to approve with the stipulation that a get out clause is put in. If yes, we sir. extend, go to yearly extensions by the by the manager, but it gives us a get out clause on this. Yes, sir. There's a notice provision in there, but I will um, confirm before the chairman signs it. Second. It. We have a motion, a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Ayes. The ayes have it. Thank you. That concludes my report. Thank you. Next is the county manager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to present to you tonight. Felt like a normal meeting for once tonight with having the folks in the room. I, I felt somewhat normal <laughs> for once. It's been six months, but um, we got several items for you tonight. Uh, last Thursday, the chairman, uh, vice chairman, and I met with the mayor of Vanceboro about the Vanceboro Library. It is a municipal-owned building. It houses the Vanceboro branch of the Craven Pamlico Library System. For many years, uh, the town of Vanceboro has contributed uh, to the library financially and by doing certain maintenance items on the building that they own, along with the water bill, trash service, sewer, things like that that they don't bill us for. This past budget year, they did eliminate funding uh, for the library in totality, and we're at a point where we're starting to get some high-end type maintenance items that need to be taken care of. And for instance, right now, an air conditioner that needs to be replaced. Uh, Mr. Hodges had our, our staff look at it. Uh, Commissioner Jones received and Commissioner Mark received calls about the temperature inside the library. Um, in reviewing uh, what the cost would be, it became a challenge for us without any type of agreement with the town of Vanceboro to provide any type of level of support to a building we didn't own. Uh, financially and from a staff standpoint. So we talked with the mayor about several options, what stuck between the two groups, and of course he has to go back to his board um, to discuss this, but a long-term lease between Craven County and the town of Anceboro, something 50 plus years, where we inherently have an ownership in the property, it will maintain as a library in perpetuity through that um, lease agreement, and we would feel comfortable adding that in as another structure within our maintenance department. Uh, obviously, I'm here tonight to kind of broach the subject with the board. Um, we would need to go ahead and start working with Mr. Grady and Mr. Davis, who's their attorney, start formulating what, what it would look like. We don't have an agreement now. 
I would say uh, this is not uncommon from the county as we currently use the same methodology with the Newburn Senior Center here. Uh, that's owned by the city of Newburn. Uh, we have, uh, I believe, a 99-year lease on it, Gene, and if it ever stops being a senior center, it reverts back to the city for whatever use they would have. I would suspect we would be looking at similar language in agreement with Vanceboro that this lease would be contingent on us maintaining a library there. Of course, we have an out clause. We don't, you know, if that doesn't work for us anymore, then we would just cancel the lease and they would have the option to, uh, with some significant notice period um, there. So, but again, I think the details need to be worked out between the two attorneys, but I just wanted to gauge your interest in this uh, before we spend any money there. And I would note we do own the other three libraries. We own the Newburn Library, we own the Coast City Library, and inherently through the community college, we own the Havelock Library, even though it's part of the college. Mr. Chairman, um, this went before the um, Craven Pamico Regional Board of Trustees at our last meeting in August, and it discussed about what to do about the air conditioner, and the board unanimously consented that they did not feel like that we needed to spend uh, regional library funds on a building that um, we did not own and that you know somebody could tell us you know I don't think they do it but you know it, you know they could tell us you know you need to be out um, the cost of uh, fixing the unit there's two units there is around fourteen thousand dollars and so it you know it's a pretty good investment there is going to have to be an investment also in the near future of probably a roof um, and other things. So um, we're, we're at a standstill. Uh, we are getting into some cooler temperatures, but um, still it is something that needs to be resolved. Yeah. And the mayor, the mayor of Vanceboro uh, states that uh, they don't want to lose the library. They, they feel it's important to the municipality. Um, I happen to think that this is the best way for us to handle this, mm -hmm. and I think Commissioner Jones does too. Yeah. So, uh, would you like for me to begin working on a long-term lease agreement with the town of Anceboro? I would, yes. Okay. And I, I would like to add, Mr. Chairman, that we did talk with the mayor about the importance of Anceboro having skin in the game when it comes to funding the operation of the library. He, those comments were well received. Yeah. Um, I think there's been some recent changes there that may help influence that decision uh, in the affirmative right. moving forward. Um, so, the next item, 2.5 executive order came out and we are moving into the next phase. As you noted tonight, we're allowed to have more than 10 people in the room now. Because of the room size and dynamic, how we have set up, we can't really get the six foot spacing, so we're still kind of limited, but we were able to get people in and out and have people in the room that weren't here a meeting ago. <clears throat> what that also means is there's some other county functions um, that are changing along with this executive order. One is playgrounds open on Friday. That was a sigh of relief for a lot of parents, including myself, that need a place for kids to go. Uh, we are also picking up with some of our league play at Parks and Recreation. Some of our baseball and softball leagues will begin to play games. We've been working with those leagues. There are still restrictions. I mean, it's not a wide open like it was uh, last year, but we're, we're excited to have those folks getting back out. Our parks have seen high usage um, this year with COVID, which is a good thing. Um, it's been an outlet for folks to be able to get outside and, and get some um, enjoyment of them. Uh, other things that are not so good news uh, is the convention center. And Mr. Hodges is here tonight, but we are seeing lots of our groups this fall continue to cancel their events. And uh, we're still under significant challenges with the convention center on this executive order on how we can actually have an event of substantial quality and quantity meaning we're still limited to 25 people inside, which for a convention center does not work. We don't have 25 person events normally. Uh, we have, just to make the board aware, lost all the Marine Corps balls that were booked for this fall. That was an order from the Marine Corps and the Navy that those must be held on base. Uh, they are some of our partners, so we've worked with them to try to rebook in future years. But I want the board to understand that is a significant revenue piece mm -hmm. for us for this year. Uh, it is concerning that we have spent a lot of money at the convention center and have no appreciable revenue source in the near future. 
our hope and prayer is that we continue to progress and things get better and we continue to get more back to normal. But I want to go ahead and put a forewarning out there that our revenue is going to be significantly impacted by these changes. Bit of good news. There is a lot of excitement about our new facility in the state of North Carolina and regionally. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to see some of the pictures, you, you want to stop by and you want to take a tour, it is absolutely fantastic on the inside. The, the agents who book these type things are all excited. If we can ever get to the point where we can book facilities and people can travel again, we are going to be on the top of everybody's list. And that's where we wanted to be. That was what we talked about with you when Gene showed you the plans of phase one and phase two. That we wanted to be the star of not only East North Carolina, but of North Carolina for conventions and events and things uh, here in, in Craven County. Uh, as Mr. Hodges briefed me last week, the project is progressing nicely. Uh, we should be done. Uh, Gene's still thinking 1st of October um, with the back veranda and the inside part. I believe we got a temporary CO last week for the, the ballrooms. They look great. We're doing some, some punch list stuff there and still doing some concrete work out back. Uh, we, we, I mean, I still have the belief that we need to celebrate uh, this project, albeit we'll have to figure out how, with a ribbon cutting of our new facility and a grand sort of reimagining of, of what we're going to do there. Uh, we're still working on that. We'll get back to you with a date and time. Any questions about COVID, uh, county operations, funding, anything there? I mean, you've heard all night from the water department tax that we're still significantly impacted from a revenue standpoint. However, if Mr. Warren was here, he would tell you that sales tax hadn't been that bad. And we sat around in April trying to figure out what consumer <coughs> confidence would be in July, which is very difficult. We had no idea. We assumed that people would still spend money, but it's been proven in the numbers that we've seen that we've not lost any ground there. So that's a positive statement. Uh, CARES Act funding, we have received plans from all the municipalities and all the fire and rescue departments. Uh, we've reviewed those. We had uh, only two plans that had to go back for questions. Everybody did a great job from a municipal standpoint and our, and our first responder partners. Uh, we're getting that money out the door as quick as we can because they know they have a stopwatch on them when they need to spend it. We're continuing to spend the money um, uh, very rapidly here at the county. Obviously, we have a December 30th, uh, 2020 deadline that we still need to cover. So a lot of things are happening with that, and we hope that money will be put to good use with our partners. And lastly, I touched on East Carolina Broadband and some of the meetings that uh, the commis uh, Commissioner Mark and Commissioner Jones have been with us on. I I've got a real anticipation for our next meeting. I think we made a lot of progress. We're going to be able to do some things, and we may have to use a test case first to see how this is received. But some of these areas that have no Internet, no DSL, no dial-up, only satellite. Um, we hope to start addressing soon. When I say soon, months. Uh, it's going to take some faith on our part. It's going to take some faith on the citizens' part. It's going to take some faith on our partners' uh, part there uh, to make all this work. Let me tell you some things that you should expect to see. Be lease agreements. We have dark fiber in the ground to some of our aerial assets that will need to be leased by a third party because, as I mentioned, we can't provide the service. We are prohibited by state law from doing that. So we'll need to provide that dark fiber via lease. We already do that, so it's not like we're having to create a wheel here. We're going to look at our lease with some of our industrial partners. I've already spoke with Mr. Grady about that today and see if we can get that done. The other thing, and this will be new for us, is leasing tower space on our water towers. And that'll be something we'll be working with Mr. Gerard and Gene on um, to get those transmitters above the tree line. The key in the type of internet that Senator Sanderson mentioned about in Jones County is beaming a signal from one tall structure to the next and then beaming it down to the different houses in the community. What the problem is are trees. If there is a tree in the way, it will block the signal. If you go up too high on a tall structure, it's blocked by the atmospheric condition at about 220 feet where you can't get the signal down. So we've, we've done a mapping, and I, I got to tell you, we have a, a new gentleman over in our GS department that blew my mind with some of the maps I saw, and we'll demo those for you hopefully at our next meeting about some of the areas we can cover and how much we can cover. But again, um, we're, we're on the path. It's going to take a lot of faith, but I think we're there to start discussing what agreements look like. 
I understand our folks in Harlow uh, tonight, and I, re I certainly respect those comments. I understand what they're under. The problem with Harlow from the system we're looking at with East, uh, East Carolina Broadband is there are no tall aerial assets in Harlow to beam from point to point. You've got a long stretch along Adams Creek Road where you have a water to a tower at the beginning and nothing at the end. Mm -hmm. So when he suggested from Carter at Craven Electric Co-op that those power lines could be used to run fiber, that is the answer for them. That, that really uh, got my attention today, and I look forward to have his number on my box to start working with him. Um, but that's where we progress. Are there any questions about broadband or what we're doing as a county? Mr. Oh, yeah. Yes. You know, Senator Sanderson brought up some points, and I, and I know you're aware of them and everything else, but hearing from Craven Carteret of getting some of that grant money to help them right. pay for that wiring, from there and from there to the house, mm -hmm. to those individuals. And like you said, I think we got into October, so when those are the next one is due on that, to take a look at it. So, uh, Commissioner Liner, can I? I think you bring up a good point. This is important to talk about. Carter Craven has to apply for the grant. East Carolina Broadband has to apply for the grant. There's certain criteria. We as a county cannot apply for the grant, well, we but we can support them. And right. I think that's what he asked for tonight, which is what we can do via resolution, via letter, via phone calls, via advocacy uh, with the group that makes that decision. And I think by expanding into Tier 2 counties, it gives us the opportunity now to, to really get out there and, and do the work. Sorry, I just you gave me the opportunity there, and I thought that was an important. I'll jump point. right in. Yeah, jump right in. I got one more, Mr. Okay. Chair. Go ahead. Would you mind getting with the school board since we're in the 2.5 executive order on playgrounds, and see if they're going to open the playgrounds up on the schools? Yes, sir. I'll do that. Yes. <clears throat> Actually, we're meeting. Jack and I are meeting Friday with the chairman. So we can discuss that. The chair, I have one question with the manager. Yes, sir. Are we still looking to the uh, the uh, tower there uh, in Allen Creek? Uh, the individual will erect the tower on his land? Right. He wants to erect a tower on his land. Uh -huh. If he would erect the tower on his land, it would give us a point to beam to. But the problem is you've got to beam to something between him and the end of the road. There's a certain so distance you have to cover. Right, because of the distance from our water tank to where those folks live there right, at the right. end of Adams Creek. It's long ways. You've got to have something in the middle, too. And in the middle is nothing but private land which owned by the warehouses. That's, that's, so that's the challenge when I heard him say, hey, we can use the aerial infrastructure that the electric co-op has. It solved that problem. Because that was what we couldn't get over was how do you get through the middle. Because okay. that's vital, because the signal loses its steam, so to speak. And I'm not an expert in Internet and understand how all this works, but from what I can tell, it loses steam the further you go. So the more you can beam closer, the better the signal will be when you're pointing it down to the citizen or the resident who gets the service. Okay. Cheaper and better, though, is going by line to cross those poles. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, cheaper, better, and faster. Every one of those houses has got Craven Carteret Electric. Fiber on a pole doesn't have, doesn't worry about trees. Right. Right. The thing on the top of the tower Does. is going to be highly impacted by trees. Because you have the uh, the other guy down in Adam Creek. Also, you have um, uh, Bud Phillip on a lot of land mm -hmm. down there, which I can confront him and say, "What do you say? There's a lot of land, and then we we'll take care of all the problems." I think you got a great solution that was on the table from the last speaker tonight that you don't even need to worry about right. all towers in, in Adams Creek area. Okay. From what I understood. Yeah, from... Well, with it, could I... Yes, yeah, see. Sounds this is great for, for Harlow, but what about up in Western Craven County and Commissioner Jones? They don't have a and me. Carteret... <laughs> right, right. They don't have a Carteret right. Craven... That's where East Carolina Broadband comes in. So they're a nonprofit group that's Jones, Lenore, Green, and Duplin counties. They've taken great grant money that's been put out and deployed internet to these hard to reach areas via the vertical assets. So what we would look at with Commissioner Jones is any water tower assets, whether it's Craven County or City of Newburn or whoever's out there, we would look at grain towers, uh, any type of pole that was existing in the marketplace where we could beam place to place and then you would beam it out from that tall structure to the home. Again, trees impact the signal, so it's not going to be like the direct fiber to the house, which is what, what was talked about for Harlow. Right. So you're going to have a, a significant challenge there. 
So, but so there are no pole-to-pole -pole lines owned by anybody in those two districts. Well, I think it's the difference of Adams Creek being a long, straight shot. Where what you're talking about in the western part of the county is a large geographic mm -hmm. area of pole-to-pole, -pole. and I don't know that you have a cooperative electric company there that would be able to do that. Duke. Yeah, Duke is not part of. Yeah, it's only corporate co cooperatives. That's correct. Yeah. So, all right. Well, a different question then. If we had let us, Duke is out there. Okay. Um, are those poles or buried under the ground? I guess question number one. And question number two: Has anybody asked Duke would they help? I mean, it's a pole and a line. Right. They might say no, but is there anything? Have we I think asked? that's a question that can be asked. Yeah. I think so too. And I think you're going to see different infrastructure from Duke across that region. So you're going to see some underground, some above ground. Uh, you're going to see a lot of different things there. And you're going to see some areas um, that will be challenging to get to in Commissioner Jones and Commissioner Marks district. Uh, the reason I'm asking is Duke has been um, very out there with their statements that they wanted to help rural areas provide internet access wherever possible. Um, Millie Chalk was listed as a point of contact. So they have been out in public um, very loudly saying, we'll help. So let's ask. Okay. I, I mean. Sure. It's a good, that's a good suggestion. I, I go a long time. Mr. Chair, one other thing. Jack, would you consider taking a look at, of all the comments that come in here tonight, there's really a miscommunication or a misunderstanding of who controls mm -hmm. the internet yeah. and Spectrum and all of those companies. That's what you I could say. put something on our Facebook page writing, explaining yes. that that is the state and the federal who controls that and the boundaries are set by the, by the federal which doesn't allow them to cross territories. We need some explanation so people can go online and understand and see that that's not a county function. It's, it's more state, and actually it's more federal than it is anybody, I think. Yes, sir. I'll work with Mr. Grady on some proper language for that. Thank you, sure sir. Phrase it right. That's what I had mentioned. There is a misunderstanding. I've gotten a lot of phone calls on that. And <clears throat> well, I heard, I heard a lot of things, and what I heard was advocate. And I think that's what we're here to do. And we can certainly do that when it comes to grant money and working with partners to get there. The, the one thing I want to uh, say is that um, the county manager and the assistant county manager have done a heck of a job uh, investigating this and getting us uh, information that finally I think we might, might be able to solve the problem. Right. And uh, they really have worked hard on it, and I just want to mention that. Thank you, sir. It's um, one of the more complex problems the county's seen is we lack control and we lack standing at times. But we're still advocating. That's all I had, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Any other questions? No. Thank you. Uh, at this point, uh, I'm going to turn the uh, podium over to uh, the vice chair. I have to leave. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, we will have commissioner's reports. Uh, commissioner Mitchell, you want to go first? I have no report. All right. Commissioner Sampson? Yes, I would like to say I've been a little stirred about the city at New Bern and uh, also the community college. Special, especially of concerning <coughs> The reentry program. They don't call it a reentry program no more. They, they just took the whole thing over. They're doing, a, uh, doing all the announcement about what the community college is doing. They often gasoline diesel. They often electrical. <clears throat> they often are uh, all kinds of trades. But they forget, they don't even mention the county. The county once started this program. And we never get any publicity about what the county has done. And the ones that have been on the board for a good while know how hard it was to get these trades on the map 
for this county. Even ever, just about ever since I've been up here. See, I, what, what gave me an idea, I went to school on gasoline and diesel engine down in Papico in the 60s. And I knew all the programs that they had down there was beneficial to the people in that area. And I bought the same idea when I came to the board of, of Craven County Commissioners. And I tried to work on it and try to get things started. And the county manager and, and the commissioners worked on with me to get things started. And, and we got so far at one time that we had to just about go out of town to try to get some help. To start these classes up, and some of you might remember when we had talked about going down to a, uh, New York and bring in some training people who were going to train people how to build a whole house and everything in it. And the, the, and the people would have trades, all different trades, and when they get through with the house, they, they could go they could go and build their own house and put electricity, electricity in, in there, put air conditioning in there. And, so, and the ones that was on the board at that time remember that. But, but now, we, as you can see, the, the city is taking all. They, they, it looked like the county ain't got nothing to do with it now, but any time they want some money, we really got to come in. They come into the county. We spent a lot of money to get this thing done, and, and I, I, I I just think about how publicity, much publicity, much publicity that the city and the community college are getting, in in the Craven County Commissioner, all we catch is hell most of the time. <laughs> I, I just can't understand it. But uh, we, we we need to call them in because I talk. I talked to one of the guys who, who was in the beginning when we started this program, and we're telling him about it, and, and he, he 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 felt the same way, you know, because he he knows what we had knew what we had done. See, the reentry program started started in or uh, '05, and Craven County didn't get it till about. About three years ago, we, we got the reentry program about three, three years ago, and the county, county started that. And now the city, they, they, built, they, they, they got a whole brand new program that we didn't have anything to do with. And, I, and that, that ticks me up when they go out and take all the credit and we pay all the money and set up everything. And then... The, the citizens don't think, most of the citizens be thinking that the, that the city did everything. The way, the way they're promoting it, and I, just about every time I pick up the newspaper, they got an article in there, how many programs they started. And we, and we were the first one to come out with it. And then, they, and then we, we ran in with them and, and tried to uh, promote it and get it started. And we... We even paid money to do that, and I and I feel like uh, we deserve some credit. They ought to mention our name sometime, and so so I, that's how, that's what I have tonight. Thank you, Commissioner Sampson. Uh, Commissioner McKay, who do who can John look into that issue he's talking about? Who can you talk to about that, Jason? Jack, uh, Jack, you talked to Mr. John and y'all just have a discussion yes, about sir. that. Take care of it. All right. Thank you. Yeah, the only thing I have, I mentioned to uh, Commissioner Lana earlier about the, uh, the 9 woman 9 11 ceremony we have on uh, Friday at uh, 8.30. I live by the block by the police department. So anyone interested in coming now and uh, see what's going on, we'd be glad to have you. You know, uh, George and I was planning on being, being there at 8.30 that morning in Havlock. Have, uh, Thank you, here. Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Liner. Sir, I only have one thing, and this is for the public out there. This is critical for people out there. Census comes to the end on 30 September. This county has fallen behind right. on the number 
of people that's filled out their census cards, this is going to cost this county tens, if not hundreds, of millions of dollars in federal aid. That's right. During the last census, we lost almost $30 million because people didn't fill out their cards. It's imperative if we want to continue with the programs that we've got and the possibility of an additional seat on the legislation on, on, on the federal side, we need those cards, the census filled out by all. It's, it ends on 30 September, and like I say, it's important to this county, it's important to the community, and as people for the programs that we're providing and can continue to provide. Otherwise, it's going to our neighbors. That's all, sir. Commissioner Bucher. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> kind of, an, uh, I think, an exciting announcement, and that is that uh, Lieutenant Governor and the Republican candidate for governor, Dan Forrest, will be in Craven County holding a rally this Saturday, September 12th. It's going to be held at the farm at 660 Antioch Road. Uh, starts at 6 o'clock, goes till 7.30, rain or shine. Uh, that location is just north of Bridgeton. And there'll be food. And uh, I think we're fortunate to have him here. <clears throat> he's um, he's, a, he's a, a excellent candidate, and I'm excited about having him show up here in Craven County. Um, if you're interested in attending, please go to his Facebook page or his website and RSVP because they need to know how much food to prepare. And again, it will be rain or shine. So look forward to seeing a lot of folks out there on Saturday evening. Thank you, sir. Anything else to bring? That's it. Does any other commissioner have anything to bring before the board before we adjourn? County manager? No, sir. Thank you. Having none, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. And I take that as a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, we stand adjourned. Uh -uh.